Today I'm with Charlie Burgoyne. Charlie began his career in intelligence, eventually directing data science at Frog Design and Rosetta Stone. After his time as a research astrophysicist at NASA, Charlie eventually became the CEO and founder of Valkyrie AI. Valkyrie is an amalgam of Valkyrie Intelligence, an AI ML consultancy, Valkyrie Velocity, a car racing team, and Valkyrie Capital Labs, a studio model for investment theses powered by bespoke machine learning and alternative data. Charlie and I discussed the distinction between AI ML and AGI, the future of work, the weaponization of drones, attacking AI through bad C data, faster paths of bringing forth AGI, as well as the future of deepfakes. Without further preamble, please enjoy my conversation with Charlie Burgoyne. Hello and welcome to the Arsnake Show. Today I have with me Charlie Burgoyne. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming all the way down here. You're just uh, actually positioned a couple blocks away. Yeah, I'm going to invoice the 16 calories it cost me to walk <laughs> block and a half. That's okay. Maybe it's a tax deduction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. So Charlie is an interesting guest for multiple reasons, um, but the primary thing we're going to be talking about today is AI and ML. I hear you know things about this. I'm really glad that's what you down selected. Yeah, yeah that's perfect. <laughs> if that's I'd chosen perfect. something else like yeah. basket weaving, you would have been out of your element. That's right. Did not get that merit yeah, badge. No. <laughs> just just fireman shit. What what what? So you just disclosed you're a boy scout. I did not know this about you. I I am a boy scout. I uh, I loved it. Um, I went to through Eagle and did all the oh, wow. stuff. Went yeah, all the way. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah, it was a good, good childhood experience. Yeah. So the way that you and I met was actually at a Formula One race here in Austin, Texas. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, through a mutual friend, and um, you, uh, I think we were having some drinks or something, and uh, just getting to know each other, kind of deal, which is kind of my life these days. It seems like just getting to know people. Uh, and you started telling me about this business idea, this crazy new business idea you had to start a company doing AI and ML. And, uh, I think you were a little pensive about it and I'm like, do it, just do it, get into it, do it right now. Um, and what I don't think you had known at the time, but, and maybe have since learned is that I had just done the analysis on the highest paid types of jobs out there. And mm -hmm. it was Big data, AI and ML, and I think one other thing were all the top three. I'm like, yeah. And you did it. Yeah. You uh, you now have that kind of company. And how's that going? Yeah, it's uh, it's been an amazing five years. We're about to start our sixth year. Valkyrie is, Intelligence is Val the name. Yeah, Valkyrie, yep. Um, six years ago, well, we're starting our sixth year. Mm -hmm. And uh, has it been that long? Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Um, so, we kind of came out of a pretty sad story for modern scientists in America. Um, you know, I never really set out to be an entrepreneur. I didn't really think I was going to become some, you know, multifaceted um, business starter of any mm -hmm. kind. Mm -hmm. The challenge that I was dealing with at the, at the time stemmed from you know, my first couple of years in government service. So, you know, I was, when I was 13, I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. I came from like a, very science, you know, oriented home. Dad's a scientist. My mom's in academia. And um, then 9-11 happened and my whole worldview shifted. And I decided I wanted to get involved with government science. I wanted to help out there. So um, from that point on, I really kind of redirected my focus. And um, I was I went on this path that eventually led to me getting pretty heavily involved with government across a variety of different spaces, uh, mostly working and protecting uh, American interests. And um, as that path went through, we can talk more about that or less about that. But as that path kind of played itself out, I realized that scientists have no real place where they can do incredible research, have that research have real impact in the world around them across a variety of different metrics, not just positive social impact, which is something we really champion, but also like actually meaningful impact on the businesses that, that people are running and industry, of, you know, writ large. Um, and then also job security, like it sounds kind of topical, but um, it's really important. It was really important to me that if you wanted to raise a family of five, like there could be a laboratory that would support that comfortably. Hmm. Um, and that was, you know, it was a founding treatise for Valkyries. Like, yeah, you, if you're, if you're talented, you should not be worried about things at home. 
and we can talk more about like how that's all made itself made manifest um, through the last several years. But uh, yeah. Well, why don't we start by talking about what the difference between AI, ML, and then uh, artificial general intelligence are? Because I think <clears throat> these these are topics that get thrown around a lot, and I don't really think many people they don't really know what that means. It, it, mm-hmm. it sounds like murder bots. Um, and so, what, could you could you do a little bit of a few minutes just explaining what that is? Yeah, I, I so the way we talk about AI, we usually what we're usually talking about is the application of you know, complex statistics on top of well-organized data. That's kind of more or less what we're doing. Um, well-organized, that's a big caveat. It's huge, yeah, <laughs> and it's way bigger than people give it credit for, right? That's mm-hmm. actually probably 80% plus of our job. Um, I, I personally have worked and chewed on a definition for artificial intelligence for a long time. I've worked with people, including our chief science officer, a bit actually today. We had a one-on-one talking about this. She's this brilliant scientist. Um, and um, she, she weighs heavily on these kinds of things that we think about. Um, but for me, artificial intelligence is really kind of denoted by two different fields. And they're more, more philosophical, really, than they are scientific. And that is the nature of, intellig- of, of knowledge itself. Like, how does, um, how does a fact or a datum become um, information, which eventually becomes knowledge? And those are all really distinct, you know, states, mm-hmm. um, almost like phase states of, of, ma- of matter. And then how do you pair that with, pattern recognition systems wisdom wisdom yeah sure the ability to find um logical breaks and chains that are embedded within that knowledge and then make decisions that sit on top of that one Um, of the coolest applications i heard was somebody had recorded a lot of sound of earthquakes or just the earth moving or something and for some reason the machine was able to figure out that this was there was they were able to predict an earthquake happening much higher than humans were uh, and basically every measure that one could measure something like that. And what they found out is there's this very low frequency that they just weren't even paying attention to. Mm-hmm. Like they had to do a lot of work to figure out what the computer was figuring out. But that's the kind of thing where <clears throat> enough well-organized data, you can start extracting n- net new f- ideas from that data. So 100%. Um, and my personal, so my personal biases around the nature of, governing dynamics kind of plays in here. So I, I'm of this like quasi Nashian perspective that um, all these systems that are seemingly really disparate are actually pretty interconnected to each other. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think that there is like a set of governing dynamics against which a bunch of systems operate, like icing model in three dimensions, this unsolvable physics problem probably has a lot of, of overlap with how like languages um, spread uh, based off of their proximity to rivers, for example, in Western Europe, or how fish markets are um, dramatically impacted based off of, you know, thermal variations in the ocean. Like, I actually think all those systems have really interesting parallels and that there are models that you can reapply to solve those problems. Um, In fact, our brain does this all the time. Like, when you examine neurons in high fidelity, they actually have a lot of similar properties. Like, all of our sensory neurons actually look and operate in the same way, a similar way. It's tree-like really like structure. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the synaptic relays. It's the way that knowledge or those pathways are formed that dictate how we're able to intelligently operate against those inputs. So how would you how would you structure a conversation about AI versus ML? Or would you say that they're for all intents and purposes pretty much the same thing or I think machine learning is really um, focused on the act of extracting patterns and context out of those knowledge systems. It's a sub-branch of that, that fork, mm-hmm. right? So AI is, you know, we could argue AI has the property, the, the field of AI has the properties of knowledge engineering and turning, you know, raw data into information and into knowledge, pattern recognition systems that are extracting and manipulating logic, and then decision, which is taking that logic and then operating uh, in a way that is... Um, uh, serving an, an altruism of some designation. Hmm. Machine learning really falls into that second category, I think. Um, it's, it's uh, and not entirely, I think that there's some overlap into different spaces, um, certainly in the decision side, but it's largely a sub-branch. And then AGI? Uh, so the funny thing, I think, is that the further I, so AGI would be, you know, generalized intelligence um, or this notion of, Um, This means different things to different people. The way I would describe AGI is um, the ability to have 
ostensibly infinite number of domains interrelated for context extraction and then decision making, um, which is basically what human beings do. Mm -hmm. Like you can teach humans a lot about a lot of different subjects at, at different rates and at different frequencies of or, processing. Or they, or they can extrapolate from completely separate. Like this game is a lot like chess, but it's checkers. Totally. And fewer rules and. Like, or, or if you like daydream in the middle of an office, you've got a coworker talking to you and they're like, what would Batman do? Mm -hmm. Like that's, you know, if, if Batman would like, if he were kapow, here right now, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like we, we make jokes about that, but like, mm -hmm. honestly, that's, that's a manifestation of AGI is like, you're taking wildly disparate domains and extracting these really thinly braided relationships to those domains in, in an interesting way. Like joke, a joke is my favorite manifestation of AGI, right? Um, when I, when I go speak about this stuff, I, I love my dad jokes. Like I, my kids have been so great for my career because now I have infinite dad jokes. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I'll say things like, you know, why did the, did you hear about the cow who got a promotion? Yeah. Well, she was found to be outstanding in her field, mm. which mm -hmm. is, uh, that qualifies as a dad. Joke. That's yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> and, um, but really, I mean, like if you think about it, we're bridging two different domains, like farm stuff farm domain and work domain, farm, mm -hmm. farm and work stuff. And we're able to very quickly, which is kind of fascinating when you think about it, very quickly able to braid the connection between those two with a semantic play. And like all of a sudden we are laughing in mm -hmm. ways that are like, we find that funny yeah. to accidentally bridge domains that aren't usually bridged together. Yeah, totally. It's like we find new synaptic connections to be funny for yeah, some reason. We do. Yeah. Especially when they're really totally tangential, not really related at all. Totally. totally. So I think one of the most common questions, which I'm not even sure is a particularly good question to ask, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. What do you think that AI and ML, and I'm going to leave AGI off the table for now, but what do you think that they are good at that uh, humans are bad at and vice versa? Like, is there any place left that humans are just naturally going to always be better at? Uh, so I think your question gets down to the nature, the fundamental nature of intelligence itself. Mm -hmm. And the deeper I get into this field, the less confident I become in the tenability of an AGI. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I actually think that there are fundamental unknowns about the nature of intelligence that we are not really that much closer to uncovering than we were 40 or 50 or 60 years ago. Um, we're asking some of the, we're able to um, solve some of those same problems faster and more elegantly because of the availability of new technology. Um, GPUs have been transformational. TPUs will wait and see. They have been, they have been used, but they're not, um, they're not as revolutionary as I think Google thought they were going to be right off the, the get go. Um, but, uh, but what we've seen is that like some of these, some of these formulae have really really just been empowered to do the things we already thought were possible, but we're not actually any closer to understanding the fundamental nature of intelligence. I would uh, have absolutely bet that you were going to say the opposite. I, so what have I, so would have I, you know, I used to mm. think, I used to totally think that, you know, fully conversational autonomous, um, thought was something that we'd see in my lifetime. I'm what due. about something that just will pass the Turing test, something that can just hold a conversation, no other attributes, just conversation. So I, I think, Turing tests will be passed, but I actually think that Turing tests, but that's because of our ability to look at um, exemplifications of intelligence at scale in ways that we didn't imagine years ago when like Hofstadter was writing books like Eternal Golden Braid. What I mean by that is, um, there's, I have a real example, right? So if you look at like AlphaGo or anything the Go guys are, are building right now, sure. you know, they're all they're all showing, you know, how, you know, I think StarCraft was one of the things they did two years ago that was pretty cool. Um, they're like, oh, we have a, we built an artificial intelligence that's can, that can win at Go. Well, actually what you did was you, feel, you figured out a very clever way of playing tens of trillions of simulations of the game, looking at tens of thousands of exemplifications of the game, and then rerouting decisions based off of the success of those simulations. But isn't that the same thing as imagination? I mean, isn't that what we're doing when we're speculating about whether they should or shouldn't ask their boss for a job or for a raise or whatever? Maybe, but if Go didn't have tens of, you know, trillions of combinations, but instead just three, um, we'd be far less impressed with it. And it's exactly the same technique, mm -hmm. right? If you had to choose like three numbers um, in serial, and you had to express a pattern in that number in serial, those numbers in serial. 
we aren't that impressed when the, when the computer can identify what that third number is going to be, right? All of a sudden we do it in Go, which is kind of a similar problem, and we're super, super impressed with it because we're like, oh, only humans can solve this problem. Well, no, like our comfort with permutations that are wildly nonlinear um, is, has just expanded in ways that we didn't even think were possible. So <clears throat> why can't it figure out language? Language seems like a relatively straightforward thing. If you keep into account the structure of normal language, I'm not I'm talking about, you know, extra things we add on top of language, intonation and yeah. um, color and slang and all that stuff that might might make it more difficult or even jokes, but just language. You know, I want to go do this. Why can't Siri figure out exactly what I mean when I say that? So my core belief as of now is that intelligence is comprised of multiple different domains for research for us like currently mm -hmm. but one that is undervalued because it is not treated as scientifically um, robust is the nature of neurological motivation and emotion um, and this is where things get really weird but um, one of the reasons we are able to solve complex problems as human beings is because of our ability to understand underlying motivations and have that motivation actually have an impact on our ability to solve problems and even have to some degree an emotionality around that. I don't know how to code motivation or emotional response or even emotional or synthetic emotional responses into an algorithm. Can't do that. So they, I, I ran against uh, a tweet um, a day or so ago and when I saw this, this perfectly for me encapsulates how difficult this problem is, especially if <clears throat> there's a lot of companies out there, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, who, who really want to use AI to solve all of their customer support problems mm -hmm. because it's just expensive. And they and as much as they can automate, that's just less time they're spending on it, less money. This is the tweet. I have a plan. Will we tell Boris Johnson and Putin that Putin, sorry, let me start over. <laughs> sure. I have a plan. We tell Boris Johnson that Putin has launched a hypersonic missile at number 10. And when he retreats to the bunker, we weld the door shut. Now, there's a lot of things going on in there. First of all, this person is advocating that they tell the head of their government, uh, they give them false information about national security, <clears throat> and then they effectively and falsely imprison uh, this uh, PM in uh, a bunker, and it's clearly satire. Right. So there's a lot going on there because you have to know what 10 means, 10 Downing Street, but that's mm -hmm. not obvious by the context exactly. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to like really know what's going on. You have to know what hypersonic vehicles are and that that's a threat, not just a, a thing. You have to know who Putin is and in what context Putin would be launching things and how that would affect anybody that we care about or anything. And then ultimately we have to understand that that whole thing is not definitely a joke. We don't know that that's a joke, but we can infer probably a joke. And so I should not submit this as somebody who's trying to commit a crime. This is just somebody who has kind of a weird joke that they want to tell. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to code around that set of problems. I mean, it's not one problem. It's like 10 problems in a row. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, it seems like at the best we could do is look for keywords or maybe sentiment analysis, maybe, <clears throat> and or maybe the context of the two or maybe context of this person. You know, they tend to post very inflammatory things. They've been banned multiple times uh, or they keep getting strikes against them, et cetera. Um, but beyond that, I think it, just a human has got to go look at this thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is something you're ever going to be able to automate. Am, mm -hmm. Do you think I'm wrong about that? No, I think you're right. I mean, I, th I think that's what we're what we're approaching, you know. And we're still not the the algorithm that eventually beat Go mm -hmm. is a, is basically a Monte Carlo complex chain that was formalized before I was born, and yet this is something that we herald as this big advancement, right? We don't know, we don't understand the motivations to beat Go. We know how to define success, but who actually cares about success? Like this is what, your your example is really is bringing up exactly what I'm I'm talking about is like. There are components, there are about like 10 components in that statement that, that have a proximity to, um, to raw, you know, unfiltered intelligence, uh, un, you know, non-synthetic intelligence. Um, but they all require different approaches to solve for them, which is why like AGI still becomes, still remains completely elusive. 
Like if I I cast my team, I would argue we have the I I would confidently argue we have the best AI team in Texas. But more broadly, I mean, we're a very competitive team. Um, I, I, the way we would solve those different ten different problems would take ten different shapes. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's an exemplification that we're yeah. For instance, parsing them together. How do you know? that this person doesn't have a mass group of welders who are willing to risk their lives to go weld somebody into a bunker. Obviously that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Or maybe this person's just crazy and they really believe that their welder buddy is going to join them in this crusade to weld somebody into a bunker. Yeah. I, I can't definitively tell you, <clears throat> even me, Robert Hansen, I can't definitively tell you this person isn't just crazy. Mm -hmm. And yet I also can definitively tell you that this is just satire. Mm -hmm. It's a very weird thing that the human brain can do. It's extremely strange, and I, I think it it hinges on... So there's like two really great tracks we can go. So mm -hmm. we should like fork this, sure. go down this go branch, ahead. and we can come back to it. Um, so uh, the fact that your... Hmm, the fact that your brain can reconcile that, and my brain can reconcile that, and when I tell my lame cow joke, mm -hmm. there's like people will either acknowledge that it's funny and not laugh because it's not that funny or laugh uh, in it. Right. Two out of 10. So you're, so you're the first <laughs> group. That's fine. I don't need, I just need to people say, I don't, as long as people don't say, I don't get it. Right. Then we're gravy. Yeah. Right. Cause that means that that braid yeah. now that synaptic braid exists. For them. <laughs> but when that happens, the fact that all of those people can appreciate that, I've probably told at this point, 5,000 people that joke, the fact that that is ubiquitously a, a appreciated as the synaptic braid, I think, is indicative that we are fundamentally solving the problem of AGI with the wrong underlying mechanics. Mm -hmm. This is where things get kind of wonky in the whack doodle do, you know, mad scientist brain that I've got rolling around. Um, I actually think that silicon based approaches for computational AGI is the absolute wrong way to go about it. Um, I think we're, t we're trying to solve this problem in a state that is, um, extremely resistant to the natural formulations for how knowledge is stored in organic reference points and then how patterns are exhibited on top of that. What I mean by that is using binary approaches in silicon, a, a collection of gates to allow or disallow problems at the tiniest level and then um, f with static operators at the mid level to, you know, all the, the, all the entirety layer of a, like, let's say you program an FPGA, you'll never program a, uh, an FPGA to the point where it's able going to, it's ever going to be able to solve for an AGI problem. Because I think fundamentally, we're not solving problems based off of collections of gates and arrays. What we're actually doing is figuring out interesting ways of bridging components of information together. And the operator that sits on top of that is really topical. Um, I have an example that shows you why this is the case, I think. Um, so if I asked you to like figure out the biggest prime number under 4 million on a pad of paper with no other tools. That would take a while. You, it would take a while. <clears throat> it would take some humans an, an infinite amount of time. It would take you a while. It would take me a while. There's probably a dude or a dudette out there who could do it in like 15 minutes. Sure. Power to them. Yep. Um, but if I, if I asked you who, you know, your best friend growing up was, and they walked across, like through, like past that window over there, and it was raining outside. Like you would, 99 times out of 100, you're gonna identify them in really bizarre situations, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can identify them when they're wearing a hood. You can identify them um, if they, all you see is like them look at their watch, which is really wild, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if we take a quick pause and look at how silicon solves that problem, like your Apple Watch can figure out the largest number under prime number under four million super super quickly, like in under forty seconds, I would guess. Especially sure. if you developed a custom app for it, and then, but if you gave you know the world's largest cray the task of identifying your friend in basically any circumstance other than head on plus or minus twenty degrees pitch yaw or roll, mm -hmm. they're gonna really struggle, right? Mm, yep. Much less what you're doing, which is like you're looking at like their gate in the rain with clouds and fog, and you're like, handle that's my buddy. <laughs> What I think is going on is that it's not that we are computing faster. We know we're not. We like we know what our frequency is in our in our noggin. But what I think is going on is that the really elegant solution that biologically you've developed is the ability to store complex semantic objects in just a, a super simple and interconnected way. Mm -hmm. I.e., the model of your friend 
has less to do with your ability to pattern recognize and recognizing your friend has less to do with your ability to recognize patterns very, very quickly and more about the nuances of how you store your friend. It's a collection of things like their gait, the way they sound, the way they look, um, their environmental decisions that they make, clothes that they wear, a plethora of things that you actually, and I bet you good money, you're probably thinking about all these things with your friend right now. <clears throat> well, I saw you walking down the street <laughs> earlier. I knew it was you from... Get out of from, here. No, I'm not kidding. I actually recognized you from probably over a block and a half away. See, that's, this is this is a weird thing. Yeah. No Cray could do that. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to be able to figure out that prime number. I mean, to be honest, it was definitely this get up you've wearing. Yeah, yeah this didn't help. I, <laughs> I, I, I dressed for an audio podcast today. My, my apologies to the R Snake show. Uh, but but like that's what I'm getting at. Is like We're not solving problems with silicon. Silicon's really good at some things, really bad at others. I think the big difference between finding a number under 4 million and looking at your friend and recognizing who that is, is that arithmetic's really straightforward. Like, we can easily codify that. There's really no patterns that go into that. But how do you match complex models to other complex models? That's something that uniquely the brain does. And I contend that silicon is really, really bad for that, especially the knowledge structures that we're using for silicon. I actually think the closest state we'll ever get to an AGI is by harnessing the power of uh you're gonna think i'm nuts is by harnessing the power of organic material to offload our knowledge store and processing for us cyborgs kind of Mm -hmm. like i think the i think the step before cyborgs is a greenhouse full of instrumented plants the proteins of which we are manipulating to store complex information and then bridging across them in ways that are much more rep- like much more um, reflect the way that we do this in our brain. You're right. I do think you're crazy. <laughs> um, all right. So let's talk about AI ethics, um, sure. which I think is definitely one of those things that we, uh, anybody who spends any time thinking about this goes a little bit kind of haywire. When you start talking about trolley problems, when you start talking about um if a self-driving car and it has to make a decision whether it hits the old lady or hits the school bus or whatever. Um, but before we get there, you know, I've heard a lot of talk about Isomov's um, uh, three rules of robotics or whatever. A lot mm-hmm. of talk. Mm-hmm. It seems like it comes up nearly every conversation about this topic. And I have yet to see one robot ever to have them built into it. It's funny because everyone talks about it. Everyone. But then I'm like, okay, well, did it run over that woman's hair and like start sucking her up into it? Or did it <laughs> slice this person in half because they just walked a little too close to it? Like these, these systems have absolutely none of the context about what it would actually take to actually model or even let alone adhere to these rules. Mm-hmm. Are you seeing that? Are you seeing sort of just a lack of ethical compute put into these systems? Is there any ethics at all being built in or is it this is just all people pontificating about the moral philosophy associated with it so there's there's two ways to answer that question um the the first which is could sound demoralizing but it shouldn't it should be invigorating um we're not at the point yet where ethics are something that we can we can we can create a collection of rule a rule-based operators for machines sure but ethics is certainly something that is way down the line once we've solved the problem for emotionality, motivation, core tenets of intelligence that we still don't really understand. How about just not sucking someone's hair and when they sleep and the Roomba just comes by and just yeah. eat, starts eating on them? We can totally codify that. But like the way that actually looks right is like, um, you know, we would say things like, okay, it, you know, in the split second you've identified this object, if it has these pr- properties, it's cylindrical about 10 microns wide and uh, has a tensile strength of like, you know, 62 Newton pounds, whatever it is, like stop doing that. But the problem is like, okay, well. But that's not going to suck up the dog hair that's it, stuck in the floor. <laughs> precisely right. Like the idea, like why we don't, the problem is we don't mm-hmm. know how to codify why you don't suck up hair. Mm-hmm. And so Asimov's rules are giving a lot of lip, are giving a lot of lip service, but it's only because like it's only lip service because we don't actually know how to tell a machine you don't want to do this because this is bad and until we do that we're going to have to code every single exemplification of why it's bad well at minimum we need to know a robot needs to know what a human is how about we start there if your robot can't tell what a human is you probably shouldn't mass market this thing and put it out in the totally. world totally yeah i mean we're we're having a hard time identifying people because you know their complexion 
is different from traditional models, much less identifying their species and whether or not we should hurt them or not. Like or, it, or how about them just laying on the ground? And well, people don't lay on the ground. They lay in beds. They, they stand yeah. up, they walk around. Sometimes they pass out though. So. Right. And there are edge cases too. Like, you know, the like Roomba. Drinking. <laughs> yeah. Roomba is like knows to not, you know, you know, the Roomba knows not to pull your hair, but if we were able to actually code ethics, it should also know not to fall in the bathtub, you know, while you're in there. Mm -hmm. Like that, that, that's the problem. It's like we have to code the our current solution is like, okay, let's code the bathtub and let's code the hair and let's code, you know, whatever else is going to kill your children and dogs and people and cats and, you mm -hmm. know, and that's what really you asked earlier, what's the difference between, you know, AI, AGI and um, ML. ML. And I think actually this is an exemplification of narrow bands of AI. So they're narrow, intelligent decisions that we can prescribe that are almost exclusively rules-based, built on top of heaps and heaps of data that are making decisions that are extremely prescriptively designed by um, by technologists. That's really narrow AI. But aren't these technologists spending a lot more time productizing than thinking about the implications of their product? Like this is this is what I'm worried about. Like we spend a lot of time talking about the trolley problems, but I think what's really happening is no one is thinking about the trolley problems who's actually working on those things. They're just making sure it doesn't crash into stuff, which is fine. I'm, I'm glad about that as well, but it's not, they're not coding in trolley problems. They're not coding in ethics. They don't know what a human is beyond the fact that it's just another object that they're not supposed to hit. That's precisely right. Now we can weight the human object. We can say, okay, when you recognize a human object and you recognize um, a mailbox, go drive over the mailbox. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, that but it, I don't it, even think they're doing that. I, I would, I don't know. Actually, we have, friends in town now that um, you and I have met who would know exactly the answer. Sure. Okay. Probably the best in the world for that particular problem um, um, who will remain nameless and also completely obvious at the same time. <laughs> but the, but the reality is like, I'm, I, I bet, I bet there is somebody who's working on that exact problem. Mm -hmm. um, but the, but the reality is, is that once you solve for the mailbox for, box versus the human, okay, well then you're going to go wait every single other thing you could possibly run into. What about, what about something that you can't recognize that like, the trolley problem is interesting only to the point where you don't consider the fact that they have to have a one-off solution per, per that problem. Mm -hmm. Where it gets more interesting from my perspective is what happens when there's an object that is roughly two meters tall, roughly 100 kilos, that is standing next to a human, and the computer can't ascribe what that object is, and there's a probability that that's two humans standing next to each other, right? Or so two, 200 kilos, let's say, and you know, a, a meter wide. But it could also be a giant mailbox, or it could also just be somebody wearing a costume. Or it could be something. It could. I mean, Halloween is a thing. It's a thing. Mm -hmm. But I guess the, like the, the trolley problem is significantly easier because those are explicit things we can code for. Mm -hmm. When decisions have to be made with ambiguity, so here's a human, you're going to either hit the human or you're going to hit this thing that could be two humans or it could be a trash bag. That's actually that's actually a really big problem. Um, I'm willing to uh, suffer that problem, though. Because at least then it tried to do the right thing. Right now, I'm not even sure it's trying to do the right thing other than just stop, which is great. At least it's trying to do that thing. But yeah, I, I get a little concerned when people talk about the ethics of AI because I I don't think no I don't think anyone is actually working on this who actually works on robots. I think I think there's a lot of people pontificating about it and making making overtures to like this might be what it looks like if we ever get down this path, but. What I don't see is people codifying this in code and saying, here's my here's my AI code that everyone can deploy and say, here's the safe thing that will, if you can tell me what a human is with your software, because your your hardware can see it, then it will do the right thing. Now, it doesn't have to decide, it doesn't have to know what a human is. Yeah. But as long as your program and say, there's a human here and what should I do about it? It seems like that no one's even working on that problem. I don't. I can't speak for the teams in the robotic labs that are doing that. I, I will say that we're still depending on a degree of discernment that we have not been able to synthetically create. Hmm. Like the idea of discernment that's more. I, I want to be wrong, by the way. I don't. Uh, I don't think. So, um, I, I think there's probably are people who are thinking about this and developing code for it, but we're still in such a nation, nation, nascent state for the nature of intelligence that having a, a an electric car decide between a trolley and a person mm. is is not that much it's much closer to the problem of identifying whether a gun should be able to shoot or not shoot um 
as than it is to a, uh, a full on robot. Try, I'll, robot. Try to, I'll try to get one of those guys a tracking point over here. I think, <laughs> I think that is a very interesting topic as well. It but, is, yeah. So let's talk about the future of work while we're talking about like the ethical uh, aspect of this stuff. I think one of the more interesting topics about AI is what it's going to do about people's jobs. Is it going mm. to make them better? Is it going to get rid of them? Um, wh where do you stand? Where do you think this is going? Like five years, 10 years, 20 years, like where, where are we going? Are, are mm -hmm. most jobs going away? Are most jobs just getting better? Are they changing in ways that we just can't perceive or? Uh, so this is a super nerdy way to answer that question. I, and uh, so I've got two. As opposed to everything else so <laughs> yeah. far. Yeah, right. That's fair. <laughs> uh, so I've got a Star Trek and a Star Wars, two analogs using Star Wars and Star Trek. This is the first one. I don't know if the other one will come up, but there's a good chance it will. Um, so in the future, right, or I guess the long, long ago, but in these two paradigms, right, mm -hmm. there's two different roles that machines play, largely. In Star Wars, the, you know, C-3PO and the droids are basically anthropomorphized to the point where they, they're really indistinguishable from people. Like, C-3PO misses some nuances of stuff, mm -hmm. but that's really like a character flaw as much as, much as it would be for you know someone with Asperger's it, it, totally yeah. yeah somebody who right somebody who's who's a little um or just doesn't speak the language well yeah whatever, yeah, yeah. Right? totally totally so yeah. that we accept that it's like that's a human yeah. just like that's made out of brass yeah. um in Star Trek and I'm fixating particularly on like the next generation right the computer is all about descriptive analytics and predictive analytics they're not like computer like let's go have a beer and talk about the nature of you know, whatever. Sometimes the hologram I episodes was say, get into that. Uh, I, with holodeck. the exception of the holodeck, ex, ex, you know, episodes. Which always end up taking over the ship, by the way. Right. And it's like, <laughs> just turn that thing off. Like, you'll get short leave somewhere else. But those computers are all, are always doing things like, you know, hey, where's Captain Picard? They're like, he's on holodeck four. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, how long until we hit this asteroid? Probably 12 minutes or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. It's giving these kinds of descriptive feeders and predictive feeders. data. For, exactly. And... I think a lot of technologists and futurists are thinking that our future is Star Wars. And I actually think our future is Star Trek. And this is a good, in, my, in our lifetime, and this is a good thing, actually. Um, because when you look at Star Wars, they're like dealing with a lot of the same problems. Like, it's not really that interesting. It's, it's, their universe is, is punctuated by... Um, so what it, about the character Data? There's a there's so, this whole character. Yeah, so data is a little bit of an issue with this paradigm. But <laughs> apart take him the, out. Take, take him take, out. Take the holodeck. Take him out of them. But I mean, but data is actually, he's a lot warmer because he struggles with emotion. It doesn't exist for him, right? They mm -hmm. give him a chip in one of the movies and it's totally lame. But <laughs> but like data doesn't understand emotion. He doesn't get jokes, right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't know how to do contractions. He doesn't, like he does, he really struggles with all the things that we just talked about. In mm -hmm. fact, it's kind of a, it was kind of a prophetic character to cast because these are all the things that I think really stand in the way of, of an AGI. But what I think is really interesting about Star Trek is in that future, They've basically created a paradigm where computers have automated everything that is tedious. Everybody only has a couple of, like the entire ship only has a couple of jobs. There's the scientists who just think about interesting things and have the computer like run tests. There's the doctors who think about interesting things and have the computers run tests. There's the commanders who think about interesting things, geopolitical, poly political science, like related problems. And you get where I'm going. Mm -hmm. They all sit around in their pajamas all day and think about interesting things and like have meetings over Earl Grey tea with it, right? That's, I think, the future that we're working towards. And so my litmus test for whether or not something is going to be automated is um, what can we currently do that we can also have a very complex intellectual conversation while doing? And if that action is going to be automated probably in our lifetimes. You think so? I think so. Like I, in Star Trek, all they do is think about intellectual things because that's actually the only differentiator we have against computers. And I think we will for the foreseeable future. So that's actually, so people say, oh, you don't believe in AGI or you don't think that, you know, this generalized intelligence is tenable. I'm like, no. And they're like, oh, well, so is AI even important? I'm like, yeah, it's actually going to be the only thing that moves this next era, this next epo epoch really of industrial transformation. But it's not going to take the shape of like these, you know, anthropomorphized Hollywood characters. It's going to take the shape of all of a sudden you don't do things other, you don't do anything other than be creative and be intellectually, you know, complex mm. and make that manifest and have computers do everything that's tedious. So I want to take it even further. So 
right now we have what I like to refer to as the rental generation. No one actually owns anything anymore. Um, uh, you don't own your car anymore. You have an Uber. You don't have a house anymore. You rent the house. Uh, you don't have even movies or whatever. Everything is Spotify or whatever. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> in that world, it's going to become harder and harder for someone to actually have anything. They're, they're just going to be consumers of whatever they can get through their devices. And that's pretty much it. In that world, where do you see the idea of AI ML actually reducing the cost of ownership? I mean, because I, th I think this is where things are going. I think effectively everything that we buy right now is going to go to zero. Um, you're, you're going to spend pennies to go across the state. You're going to spend pennies to stay in the nicest wherever. Uh, you may not physically go there. You may just put on your helmet or whatever, but <clears throat> everything is going to be so cheap for you to experience whatever you want to experience or do whatever you want to do or have whatever you want to have because you won't actually own it. And all of that will be driven by AI. Do you feel like that that's accurate or do you feel like things are going to stay expensive and people are still going to want their mansions. And um, I think to answer that we need to, it's a really philosophical, like it's an existential question that predates whether or not AI is going to be able to own that, like that, that version of, of the reality. I mean, robots are making things so ridiculously inexpensive already. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And it, so our relationship with privacy and possession is something that has evolved dramatically and also reached a catalyst, you know, the big control alt delete, which is the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, my personal contention is that I think we're going to see a return to ownership um, that's derived from our existential need to be tied to things that are larger than ourselves, which is a manifest, which can be manifested by our relationship with our own labor. It's a really annoyingly phrased, um, articulated way of saying, um, we as a species have to believe in things that um, exist outside of our own body, out of our frame. Now, some for some people that's a god, some people that's religion, some people that's logic, mathematics, um, values, virtues, ethics. Some some people it's nothing, and a lot of those a lot of those people really struggle. I think. Um, I think they struggle, but what alternative do they have? <clears throat> so their, their jobs are all going to be replaced, and <laughs> so they're going to have to afford a lot with a little. So I think what that what that has catalyzed. So the way we think, or I think the pandemic has catalyzed is an appreciation that if you don't have major things that you believe in that exist about outside of yourself, then tying yourself to what you are able to manifest personally is all of a sudden given a major weight. Hmm. Um, so that ex like so we have people who are working at Amazon now for you know sixty dollars an hour who are leaving and taking jobs as teachers for twenty five dollars an hour. Or people who are, you know, this great resignation, which is occurring all over the planet, particularly in the West. Um, this is, I think, the the population's rejection of a of a paradigm where they do not have a deep relationship with something that is existentially as big or bigger than they are. So, would you say that that is the reason that we need to work? Because it's not so much about the money; it's more about having some purpose mm -hmm. and that and so it doesn't really matter ai could do all of the more tedious things but we would still want people would still want to find something to do to fulfill their lives and that's not a video game so i'm what i'm about to say is going to feel like i have a prejudice against this paradigm mm -hmm. but i will start with saying i absolutely do not and there are merits to both of these paradigms um our parents and our grandparents generations were comfortable doing jobs that largely our generations would reject, right? Um, working in, um, for example, I, my grandfather worked in, you know, building boots. Um, mm -hmm. Now, stitching a boot is, there's nothing wrong with, that's actually a great job, but the reason he was able to do that for his whole life was largely because he believed in, he was very religious, he had his family unit that, and for him, his job was a way of enabling the things that he very much believed in and it, a nine to five job where you're building a boot is totally a worthwhile sacrifice for the things that they, that he believed in that was bigger than him. Now, fast forward 70 years, um, we don't have like the, the family unit has evolved dramatically. 
not in a better or worse way. I'm not making a moral judgment on it, but it has definitely evolved. We have people who are waiting way longer to get married, way longer to have kids, way redefining the nature of a nuclear family altogether, and also people who don't have the faith the way that they used to, and the digitization of relationships that has really broken down like geographic community. We still have community in other forms, but my grandfather knew all of his neighbors. I don't know all of my neighbors. I mean, I, I do now. I'm on the HOA, but uh, I don't. You know, I usually don't know all my neighbors. Um, <clears throat> he had a faith and he had family. I and could, I, th- I could get pretty creepy pretty fast, but I think I'll <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <to> refrain. <laughs> um, so, so he had all those things. My kids may not have any of those things. Mm-hmm. And so what their relationship, where they find greater purpose is like, well, if I'm going to be making a boot all day, I better really believe in this boot. And maybe I don't believe in boots. Maybe I believe in sandals because with sandals, I can go help kids in Kenya who don't have shoes at all. Or I can help kids in Siberia who, um, you know, I don't know, because of global warming, it's now a beach. And so all their boots don't work. Like, I don't, I don't care what the use case, but they have to have like, all of a sudden, this isn't just a boot. This isn't just a commodity like it was for my grandfather. This is actually a manifestation of their own existential extension. And that's a really bizarre, like, I would have said, like, there's no way actually it's going to evolve that way. But I think we're seeing it. I think the Mm -hmm. Great Resignation is actually um, a reaction to that. And I think that that will change our relationship with the nature of ownership of property. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's also part of it. People will get more into making their own yards and fixing their own cars. So let's talk about AI and war a little bit. So drones, <laughs> dro- well, I, because I think, I think, you know, the fluffy part is that we get to do more with less, yeah. but we also have murder droids that are, you know, potentially roaming battlefields, killing what ins- indiscriminately from their perspective, um, from our perspective, perhaps, you know, point them in that direction and let them go. Or, you know, if, if you're wearing a red outfit, kill that person or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I think people think that this is far away and I don't think it's far away at all. In fact, I think it's already happening and I think it already happened. I think it already happened in Turkey. Uh, they had a STM cargo two killer drone that apparently could loiter and detect that there's some enemy craft and start shooting it. And apparently that's already been used in Libya. Mm-hmm. So this isn't a far away future, or at least it's not a far away, uh, future where it's, it's not used to some degree, right? But I also think in other places, um, we mentioned um, Tracking Point. Uh, they're actually here in Texas, as a matter of fact. The other one I saw was smartshooter.com. I think that there are places where you could have a gun that just sits there and loiters and just sit it up and eventually it sees somebody across the path and, and shoots them. Mm-hmm. And that's not far away. That's, mm-hmm. that's something you could do with, I mean, I feel like I could do that in a handful of hours with a couple of pieces of components. I feel like you could as well. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the ethics and the future of all of that going? Like where, how far away do you think it is? Like, what's your opinion on that? I really don't think it's that far away (laughs) from an ethical perspective than where we are now. I mean, I think those tools, what we're doing is removing the proximity for the, to the actual trigger, but the decision-making is still largely, um, it still hasn't evolved where that decision is being made. What I mean by that is if you set a, a drone when, you know, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a hunter killer or an MQ nine, we gotta be a little careful about how we talk about some of these subjects, but um, let's say you set up a drone and it says, okay, you know, loiter until you see X action, somebody coming mm-hmm. out and um, this, somebody coming out is going to have a black shirt on, kill that, kill that person with the black shirt. Um, that's really not that that the tooling is different, but the act the the decision making itself was is, made long ago. Was made long ago, and it's really not that different than if you're just standing outside that room holding a pistol and you shoot a guy who comes out wearing a black jacket or whatever I, I said it was. Um, now it gets a little bit fuzzier when we have kill like, all black jackets. Kill all black jackets, or if you have above a sixty percent confidence that that's a black jacket, just kill it. Um, but that's actually again that's. That's still the same. That's still that same decision is being made previously. Like mm-hmm. that, this made far away. Um, so we're just removing the you know the time and space dilation from that decision itself. But it's the same operation, same execution. Sorry, it's the same operation for making that decision that we have. So, I, you know, 
until we get to the point where a hunter drone, and this is what I was talking about earlier with, you know, the nature of like motivation and emotion. Until we get to the point where a drone says, I want to protect American interests and I'm going to go sleuth out like what's going on in this well, place. But even before we get there, I mean, there's going to be some <clears throat> little girl who is wearing black or there could be just a school bus of people coming back from a soccer game and their colors are black and um, a, a soldier sitting there in a, you know, in an aircraft or even looking at a camera might go, whoa, 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 that's, <laughs> that is not who we're after, you know, mm -hmm. once you completely abstract, I mean, these programs have to get extremely good. And, and again, I don't even think, think they understand Isomob's rules. So they're just indiscriminate. They're just like, okay, here's the, the very specific parameter you gave me and I'm going to go shoot it. And that's pretty much it. I, in this case, I think we're a little bit better off because I think what's happening is they're shooting tanks mm -hmm. for armored vehicles. Mm -hmm. Not many school children driving those around, but I do think that if you start extrapolating where this could go, it gets a lot more fuzzy and there's a lot more room for error. But these are, these are statistical actions built on statistical actions, superimposed, like superimposed on top of statistical actions. Right. Yep. And I, I think it's like, what's our tolerance? We can't even tell what a human is if we're on a Roomba. That's probably, that's <laughs> certainly true. And I mean, when we pulled out of Afghanistan, right, the two days after um, we we thought we issued a strike against um, a couple of a couple of operators in retaliation to some action. We ended up killing a family. You know, four or five kids were in a car. We killed them. Every you know, nine people or something like that. They were on in the vehicle. Um, that was a human led operation. So humans don't get it right 100 percent of the time, right? So I guess you know what we have to get comfortable with is what tolerance do we have for the decisions that are offloaded based off of ethical rules that we ascribe to those machines. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be our paradigm for our lifetime because I don't, I don't believe that we were going to be able to have machines inculcate ethics or motivation or emotionality um, in an autonomous way if, if, if to that point. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I also am not giving credit where credit's due because I think their ability to tell that something is a child or something is an adult is extremely high unless you're talking about you know somebody with some disfiguration or something that might skew the data and also i think these these uh, things have gotten fairly good at understanding what a human is but mm -hmm. also i mean i have a vehicle that can detect humans um or deer and it regularly detects a dog as a deer and various other things so there is definitely a lot of room for improvement in these systems but i think directionally they're actually quite good and mm -hmm. getting much better even Especially if you're talking about this building needs to go away or, you know, I, I think one of the cooler things I've seen is uh, you can loiter over a city, which is huge invasion of privacy for all kinds of reasons, but they can lo loiter over a city and they're actually doing this in U.S. cities as well, not not uh, battlefields. And uh, some crime is committed at, you know, eight o'clock at night or whatever, and you find out about it a couple hours later for whatever reason you can rewind the clock and see what happened. Okay. So you can see them breaking in now, right? Rewind it further and see where they came from, mm -hmm. where they came from this house over here. And mm -hmm. you know exactly what, who they are and where they're going. So there's some really interesting implications of, um, the automation that you can add on top of these autonomous systems that might be hugely useful for all kinds of things in the battlefield. Mm -hmm. I've also heard, uh, really interesting things like, well, we could, we could shoot lasers down from space and just have them kind of constantly going over the entire world. And then some jihadist is recording the battlefield and now you know exactly where they are because you can see this the signature that's been imprinted on the sand behind them or whatever. Yeah. So there's some really cool things that could be brought about to bear that wouldn't really be possible without that sort of loitering ability and the automation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> I think their strengths are... This, the strengths have been manifest not necessarily through the decision-making ability, mm -hmm. but more of their ability to commingle these disparate <clears throat> domains of sensing. You know, the the drone that loiters above the city to identify as cr crime, right? It's got the visual spectrum that it's, you know, interpolating. So I'm saying, okay, this is a person running from door to door with a, you know, blue hat on. Um, but then maybe they also have, you know, infrared, and they also have, uh, you know, thermal imaging. So they can say, oh, they're they're carrying a gun, and it's still still hot it's still hot and um, we heard you know they have audio equipment on board so they can hear you know the crack of a of a pistol firing and um and uh they're also connected to you know 
certain types of IP protocols for security systems. So mm-hmm. we know security, ca- you know, camera was triggered. You know, all of these things, like that's actually where, and this is like the Star Trek feature data too. Fusion. It's data fusion, right? And this is, you know, this is super cool in these applications that we're describing now. It's actually the most interesting problem that, you know, I as a scientist and our team of scientists get this to think about. This is not one plus one is two. This is huge new features on top of these things. This is... And then the nature of an object itself is like, how do you define a crime? Like we are responsible. Valkyrie's responsibility oftentimes is let's build an ontological or a knowledge, an ontological, ontological structure or knowledge structure that's responsible for encoding and understanding what is a crime across these various domains, extracting that context or making even that context availed to these pattern recognition systems. Yeah, and I think that there's something interesting to be said about um, data fusion in general. If you take something, some disparate piece of information that isn't particularly very interesting in of itself, like the speed at which something is moving, that doesn't seem that interesting. But once you apply it to some video and you're like, well, there's two people standing right next to one another and the speed at which someone's moving right next to somebody and the direction it's pointing is them you know, this is someone attacking the other person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You didn't start, you don't, it really isn't just two pieces of information. You now know exactly what's going on without having to somebody actually look at the the camera. Totally. And you don't even have to know what an attack looks like really, if you have those two pieces of information. Yeah. My, my favorite thought experiment along these lines is, um, is the, is the problem of Fitbit. So, you know, let's take Fitbit and uh, Blue Cross Blue Shields data sets. Mm -hmm. And we're going to like, we're going to make them seem a lot more simple than they actually are. But let's just say all Fitbit does is it matter, measures how many steps you take and the cadence, you know, the, the time in between them, not even the location, just time in between steps. Um, yeah, in and of itself, that day is pretty innocuous, right? You're just like, oh, how many steps did I take today? Like, cool. Way to go, Robert. I took, you know, 12, 12 uh, staircases and walked 15,000 steps. Um, and on the Blue Cross side, Blue Shield side, you're looking at data that says, um, you know, I am you know, healthy-ish. I could be more healthy because I've got glaucoma or, you know, my left foot hurts um, because of some injury when I was a kid, whatever it is. Um, And you volunteered all of that or it's been information that you've consciously been able to put up. But let's say at at scale, those two data sets get combined and now they can profile this. All of a sudden they start using your Fitbit data as this, you know, very simple... Um, you know, single dimensional formula and they do parity matching. They run parity matching algorithms to figure out what other formula looks similar for your gate. And they say, Hey Robert, you know, your gate is close enough to this other person that you probably are pre-diabetic. Mm-hmm. Now that sounds crazy. It's actually happening. Like that kind of inference is actually totally tenable in a paradigm where you have that level of finite, um, that, that level of granularity and finite information about an individual and their real-time behavior and more and larger static but very corroborated and empirically substantiated properties of that individual and sadly every time i wear those things they think i'm taking no steps at all because i'm uh my gait is so smooth it just never ever ever registers as footsteps you're all jazz man i'm rock and roll you're all jazz <laughs> dr smooth <laughs> it's um, kind of interesting though i mean that just shows like these boundary conditions um some, something as simple as gait sounds easy it really is not easy especially Someone has some dis- disorder, or yeah. they're in a wheelchair. What is, yeah, they're still traveling. Their gait might look very different than your gait. The the problem too is like <laughs> how the government sees that nuance. Like Western Europe saw that thought experiment, and they said, "Great, here's GDPR. Here's a set of regulations that say you can't commingle data. You <laughs> have to be explicit about how you use it." And they thought they were doing the West a huge service. What did they do? They pretty much effing killed innovation in Western Europe. Like there are all this interesting research that was going to depend on these overlying governing dynamics and, and interesting corollaries across domains that we didn't have any understanding or appreciation for dead, completely killed. Whereas in the United States, like we haven't adopted that like nationally, California has done some perturbations of that. Yes. Um, but we've, we've actually gotten like, we're still in a point where we can comfortably commingle data. We're respectful. And we anonymize it. But that is absolutely the frontier of how we advance the human condition through technology is by the commingling of these highly instrumented domains. Um, and Europe killed it. All right. So let's talk about attacking AI now, because I think this is the, the counterbalance to that. So if I have 
some AI system, some expert system that's just sitting there monitoring me for whatever purpose, trying to serve me ads is the <laughs> most common place I probably interact with AI, which is disturbing for all kinds of reasons for me personally, but whatever. Sure. Um, you have a guy like me who will start gaming the system. Um, I'm, I'm sitting in front of Facebook for far too many hours uh, per week, and why don't I? So I start doing it. And something as simple as me messing with it means that I don't get to see ads for months on end while it figures out how to deal with me. Yeah. Um, so me just literally clicking a couple buttons, I was able to completely mess with their systems to almost beyond repair and took them months to recover and then months more to recover the next time I did it and so on. And for years, uh, we played this cat and mouse game. So if I can do this, and I'll, I'll tell you how I did it actually, uh, because I don't think it actually works anymore. Um, <laughs> B, I basically noticed that there's multiple different ways that you can deal with this ad system. One of those is you can basically say, uh, I am, um, I, I don't like this for whatever reason. I, I am, um, I'm just, this, this thing disturbs me for whatever reason. So all the other things are like, this is spam, this is porn, this is whatever, which those things tend to be good candidates for AI. Those things, it's like, this it probably is porn and they can run their porn algorithm on it and go, yeah, that's, they don't need a human to look at that. Sure. But if I'm just upset by it, if, if it disturbs me, there's no expert system that's going to be able to tell why I'm upset about something. So sure. I knew that would have to get put into a bucket of, they're just going to have to trust me. They, there's no algorithm you're going to be able to run on it and no human's going to be able to verify it in any way. They don't know what you're upset by. What, what offends you? Who knows? Right. So they're going to put me in a different bucket. That bucket is this person shouldn't be shown this kind of ads ever again. doesn't matter what it is, just, just this kind. So it kept testing me. It kept showing me different types of ads. Like, what about this? What about this? And it just kept trying over and over to, to uh, appeal to my senses. And I kept saying, nope, nope, I'm constantly offended. All these things are offensive. And eventually the AI algorithm just gave up. It took a couple days of me doing this, every single ad I saw, and I had to do it for hours. Uh, <laughs> it took a long time because I was pretty sure this would happen. And sure enough, all of a sudden, it just like no more ads for many months. And then it came back with a, f and then it was like a fury of ads, just like all the ads. And it really was trying to test me. It's like, okay, I think I got, I think I got some ads yeah. for you. <laughs> Try these out. And I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Did the same thing. And it kept working and it worked for years. And now it's just all ads again. Uh, I think, I think they figured me out. <laughs> But I think uh, that is a good example of seeding an AI system with bad data. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of work are you seeing in the area of identifying sort of the bad guy actor who just wants to mess with the, the system and put bad data into it? Are you, are you seeing anything like that? Is anyone talking about that in your sphere? Uh, certainly on the cyber, um, in cyberspace, there's a lot of people who introduce noise like that to try and upset, you know, the the psyops, the psychological psychological operation space, the mm -hmm. defense um, environment, and we've we've interacted with that domain mm -hmm. a bit. Um, the kinds of applications that we develop, that I've developed for most of my career, um, are not really. They're not really permissive of that kind of um, uh, manipulation, mm -hmm. but it, I know it. I know it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, people are constantly. I mean, LinkedIn kind of famously um, was constantly being gamed and manipulated before it was acquired, uh, and now I actually know some guys who are doing that. So <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> and and now you know it's it's almost impossible to get access to that information because it's been so you know you know so terribly manipulated and, you know, Microsoft holds that asset pretty, pretty close to the vest mm -hmm. now. Um, DDoS attacks are another exemplification of like wild noise that's introduced to throw off algorithms. Much of the DDoS, you know, the, um, mo much of the DDoS, you know, counter, counter tools we're developing now are, are largely ML based. Mm -hmm. So creating these like mini DDoS shaped things that introduce enough signal to reduce the, these tools' ability to reject them is is a totally this, this so, thing that's evolved is, is so, developing. Uh, so another version of this, one of the things I've I've often heard people talk about is well, when we're designing these systems, we're not going to just put it online. Don't worry, you know, we'll we'll do our due diligence, make sure it works. This is absolutely nonsense. The very first thing they do is put it online. They're just like, yep, let's plug it in, see what happens. So Microsoft Tay is an, a perfect example of this thing, which I'm sure in your world has, has gotten the rounds. 
but basically for those who don't know what it is, Microsoft put up this chat bot effectively on Twitter, I think. And uh, one day it just sort of popped online and it started talking and it was kind of like a, maybe a late teens girl sort of persona. And all of a sudden people were like, oh, this is going to be fun. And they started putting all of these terrible things into the system, all this neo-Nazi stuff, yeah. and very racist and all, all this stuff. And very shortly it became racist, like within a day. Mm -hmm. uh, it did not take long at all for that system to get completely overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a perfect example of why you really need to be, have trusted input and not just take anything, you know, but a counterpoint to that is there's a lot of people who are racist on the internet. And so, <laughs> you know, where did they get that from? Did they get it from some random, uh, you know, tweets that they saw and they're like, Oh, that's actually, I, I, I now I hate XYZ race because of something I saw or like, how do you see Because this is yeah. definitely seeding bad data into a system that should have known better. And yet here we are. So it's, this is actually not the first time an NLG bot has become like a Nazi. It actually had, <laughs> like, I think it happened to Reddit a couple of years ago to um, people have been, apparently they're quite pers persuasive, I guess. Yeah. And like, I, I actually think if it didn't sound so, I actually think it's a fascinating case study on the nature of semantics more than it is necessarily the nature of like the ethical. Um, so if you, if you think about all the subjects that we could possibly discuss as a galaxy of points, um, this is kind of a crude example, but think of it as galaxy of points and then constellations are, a chain of conversations that we could have together. Mm -hmm. um, the centrality or the over, like the center of that galaxy is going to be comprised of the things that have the most, uh, the easiest ability to connect to these other stars in the galaxy. Um, a and B, the stars that have the least variance, but are discussing the same subject. I actually think the reason these bots be keep becoming Nazis is because the degree of eloquence for a Nazi is pretty low, which means that they look and sound exactly the same. They're all kind of saying the same things. Like mm. neo-Nazis are not known for being prophetic wordsmiths. They're, so when they're expressing themselves, they're actually kind of using very, very similar terms. There's like five words in the neo-Nazi, you know, vernacular, and they're all, you know, they're all getting commingled, right? Like if you ask somebody to discuss like the nature of, you know, um, French existentialism after the fourth revolution, the way people talk about that is going to be very different than them just than justifying that. And it's going to be very different from the way people justify neo-Nazis. I guess is what I'm getting at is that the reason... So a stronger correlation between the words? Precisely. It's like a, it's like a semantic black hole. Hmm. And that objects that orbit around it, over time, they, the orbit gets closer and closer and closer to some small nuanced subjects that have high gravity, high centrality, because they're able to be bridged very effectively, A, and B, because there's not a lot of variance in the way that they're expressing themselves. So the systems are given this false sense that the context is, uh, the context is shared because the vernacular is shared. Um, so I, I think it's going to be a legacy element. I don't think these machines are inherently, like these 17-year-old, 18-year-old, 19-year-old, like girl bots are going to always become Nazis. I think it's the way that Nazis express themselves that is used as feeding data that actually contributes to why they get to that state. It's a really it hard is, thing to articulate. But it is but. very, I know I get it completely. I, I think it is very weird though, that we keep talking about the fact that these things won't get online. And every indication I have is the very first chance anyone has to put these things online to show them off and start collecting real quote unquote, real data from the internet, semantic data or whatever. I mean, it's, it's as fast as possible. I mean, and I don't, I mean, granted, there are probably things I haven't seen that have just not made it to the light of day because people don't trust them or whatever, but collecting data online and understanding sentiment analysis is one of the most important things that people want to do in AI. I hear it all the time. This yeah. pitch is constantly getting across my desk. Like, oh, we have this new AI algorithm and what do we do? We look at, uh, you know, operational security leaks or, you know, signal intelligence or whatever, and it's coming from Twitter or it's coming from you know, dot onion addresses or whatever. And this is, th this really concerns me because it's like, well, 
what are you doing to make sure that this thing isn't being trained poorly? Or like, how are you, how are you guaranteeing? And I, and the only reasonable answer I've heard thus far, and it's not a very good one is, well, the bad guys don't know we're doing it. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, and I think that is a reasonable, although a bad defense, but a reasonable because at least then it's very unlikely that they're going to be training with bad data. And I think that the properties themselves are valuable. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to insulate the value of those properties from the bad guys. Right. Um, it's also true that there's no technique in NLX. So NLP, NLU, NLG, there's no technique that isn't extremely thirsty for real world data, in fact, entirely dependent on it. So even the crafting of these tools is dependent on feeding that. Now, it going live, it saying anything back is something that I think folks have discretion to turn on and off. And maybe they're being honest about it. Sometimes maybe they're not. Mm -hmm. um, certainly in some of the work that we've supported on the intelligence and defense side, we we play a lot with that and probably, ch ch you know, close that chapter real quick. But um, but it's certainly the case that like none of those tools would work unless we were actually feeding it with something. All that's right. So so let's do the real. Other, uh, let's do the other direction instead of consuming data, creating data. So I I went to this conference once and there was this invite only conference. You know, it's kind of kind of a crazy conference. And one of the guys there uh, put up three blocks of texts uh, and he said, okay, audience, what do you think? Which one of these was created by a human and which one was created by a robot? And only one of them was created by a human. And so everyone raised their hands and he chose which one it was, which in hindsight is just one of those shell games where he picked the one that the fewest yeah. people picked. But but stay with me for a minute. Um, it's a good con. I like the cons. <laughs> I appreciate it. But anyway. Um, the space is full of them. Uh, yeah, so. it sure is. Uh, but anyway, I started talking with him afterwards and I'm like, so like, what's this, how, how this whole thing works? And he's like, well, we basically have a whole bunch of linguists who translate stuff into other languages. I think they had three languages or whatever. And uh, they have a system of bots. These bots are all programmed to do certain things at certain times of day. So they have like roll the dice, Joe. Joe lives in roll the dice, um, Colorado. And, and he likes roll the dice skiing, but it is. And then look at the weather database hot right now. So he can't go roll the dice skiing. Uh, so he starts talking about the fact he's not happy, wish he could go skiing, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then he has a friend, Roll the Dice Sandy. Sandy lives in Roll the Dice, Massachusetts. And she looks at him and is like, oh, I, I know you love skiing so much because, you know, we're friends. And they have this long conversation back and forth. And then suddenly it starts getting nice out. The weather database says, hey, it's starting to snow. It's like, oh, I'm getting so excited because it's going to start snowing and blah, blah, blah. And then eventually they'll slip in the fact that like, oh, I wish I had a Rolex or whatever. And they'll slip in their ads, right? That's what they're really trying to do. And I said to him after he gave me this whole spiel, um, aren't you worried about the implications of you accidentally saying something that's, you know, not great? You know, like yeah. they have millions of these things set up, these sock puppet accounts. And he said, well, the idea is that we don't talk about anything controversial. We don't talk about politics. We don't talk about taboos. We don't talk about wars. We just keep it really boring. And that's his defense. His defense is just to fly under the radar and talk about something that's not very interesting. But that's the creation of data. I think you have better control if you're creating data than if you're consuming data. Yeah, it's it's cyclical. I mean, you can't really. But do the problem with him is that the humans are going to consume that data. So all it takes is somebody translating something a little weird and it being whatever, or somebody taking over that botnet. That's what really concerns me. I have a feeling that guy would be happy to sell his bot. Uh, gosh, where do we even start with that? So yes, um, my one of my biggest concerns geopolitically is the manipulation of tribes based off of um, scalable um, messages, right? A small number of people who are able to instill propagandistic messages by um, subtle variations to synthesize differences in the voices, i.e. three dudes in Moscow able to replicate 6,000 people from 16 different countries in ways that are that share the same message but are slightly varied hmm. um, and varied enough that if you read three of them, two maybe sound eerily similar, but you would be you could be convinced that there are three. 
And in fact, unless your guard's up, you're going to assume that there's three people, right? It's, it's very strange to read two different tweets from two different people and say, was this actually the same person? Nobody's doing that on a case by case, basis, right? Nobody does or that. Rarely. Yeah. Or rarely. Like maybe you do that or maybe I do that, but you know, that's just not a thing that people do. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually think that we totally undervalue that the information space is the modern war space. Like that is the foxhole of the 21st century. Um, and we have not, uh, I think that as a nation, we've really underinvested in our ability to mitigate um, the peers and the near peers who are exploiting that uh, to, a, to a sizable degree. And then you're, you're right, your friend, you know, or this person you know, um, could easily be in a position where they're trying to sell the value of that scalability um, into markets that we wish they didn't. I mean, there's a certain search engine provider that is sim- was simultaneously trying to support DARPA and defense-related projects and then sell into China. It's like kind of a hard thing to, that duality is a hard thing to manage. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. I mean, it's a really big problem. Um, it's all, those systems are only getting more sophisticated um, our best hope right now, which sounds ominous, but our best hope right now is to is for these platforms to generate so much noise that eventually the system, you know, it, it it's exacerbated. Like our ability to extract signal from that is completely is completely exhausted. So people no longer, you know, people maybe reform. They say, okay, enough of my info coming from TikTok and Snapchat because I just don't know anymore what to believe. I'm just gonna go read the Times again. You know. I've actually heard this theory a number of times from other people, very smart people too. Like we should seed more bad data. We should all seed more bad data into these systems just so it gets so overwhelming for any normal human being yeah. that they just opt out and say, I'm going to go back to, you know, brick I think and mortar that's right. reading. I think that's right. Wow. I mean, well, I mean, look at where we, where we are, where we are from a civilization standpoint right now. Right. You know, we are at a, one of my favorite stats to, bring up is the fact that we are culturally dividing and trifurcate. We're dividing and trifurcating and quadrificating and we're dividing up all over the place in ways that we never were able to before. Um, partially because our consumption of media has evolved to a point where um, it's completely, it's, it's completely, de- it's developed in like complete personality mirroring, you know, a hundred years ago, 50, 75 years ago, let's say the, there were more, um, 75, so sorry, let me back up in the sixties, you know, about 67% of the population would watch. I love Lucy live, which meant that by the time people were at water coolers on a Monday morning, everybody in America knew what happened to Lucy. Mm-hmm. You know, that's pretty wild to, to have that level of viewership. Now the most com- last time I checked last, the most common two shows watched by anybody are, um, Sean Hannity and Rachel Maddow with like 1.4% and like 0.8% respectively. That's actually super tiny, super, super tiny. And those two voices couldn't be more diametrically opposed from one another. Mm -hmm. We've got, um, and there are real ramifications for that, right? We've got um, heartbeat bills in Georgia, and we have the NRA being listed as a terrorist organization in California. That doesn't sound like one tribe to me. That actually sounds like a multi-nation state. And Which is kind of what the United States always was. It always was, but we also had permissions... um, we also had rhetorical permissions and our, you know, our window of access, acceptable discourse was much, much larger, but the media sources are actually tr- closing that, that window very aggressively. Um, and it's creating a culture of multiplicity of cultures, that means whether it's good or bad, I'm not making a judgment here, but it's creating a multiplicity of cultures that are all spawned by our ability to super, super, um, to match specific content at an extremely micro level. It's also making us dumb. I will issue a moral judgment from my standpoint here. I have very little respect for our... Ignorant or dumb. This is a very different thing. Um, I think that it's numbing. Mm-hmm. So it's it's it's, prese- it's it's processed past ignorance to, to being dumb. <laughs> so, wow. you know, I, I, I'm really worried about it. I mean, we used to be... So this is the idiocracy of... The... I, I think so, you know? Interesting. I think so. I mean, we have more people right now... You know, your, your average, can, can, people are getting their news from TikTok, which is don't ever use TikTok, like <laughs> ever, ever. They're yeah. getting it from social media sources that don't are not validated, that, you know, they're not <laughs> primary source. People are not, when they're getting degrees, they're largely Googling half the test 
questions that they're going to end up having to answer. People don't even realize how to utilize, you know, traditional sources of, of education. Um, and we see like macro exemplifications of this that really terrify me. You know, before, this is such a wild stat, in the 30s and 40s, more people, uh, sorry, um, in the 30s and 40s, uh, number one bestsellers by leaps and bounds were almost always scientific works. The number one bestseller, the years it was pub- the years that they were published, were Einstein's works on things like relativity, right? Um, photoelectric, photovoltaic effect, um, and uh, and in the in the late fifties, early sixties, people had more. There were higher subscription rates for season tickets to the opera than there were for Major League Baseball. Like we are a, we are a culture that's fundamentally evolving our relationship with the nuances of deep deep knowledge of being the first, like being individuals who can synthesize in for the complexities of a domain in a way that we can be generative and creative uh, almost as, a, as, as fluently as we want to be. But now, you know, physicists don't, physicists aren't required to go through the same kind of derivation that they were 50 years ago. We were, they used to solve problems on slide rules and we got men to the moon um, with amazing women and men stateside um, who were thinking about problems with slide rules and 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 notepads, punch, and punch cards, and actually <clears throat> they could fix their IBM machine mm-hmm. when it broke down. Yep. Now, I, I was at NASA. No. We're not doing that. Like that's we're just, we're just not doing that anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, Elon's doing that, and um, and Jeff is doing that, and and uh, and Richard is doing that. But those uh, those people are doing that as private entities, and they're taking a lot of talent from around the world to get it done, and like. You know, it's just a different, it's a different paradigm altogether. So I, I very much worry that our way of consuming knowledge and information and, and intellect is having, and, and intelligent logic um, flows and methodologies are all getting evaporated by our consumption of this extremely topical, pedantic medium. On that colorful note, <clears throat> what, let's, let's get back to AGI for a second. So I know you don't believe that we're going to get to AGI, at least not in our lifetime, it sounds like. Maybe beyond, Mm -hmm. do you think? Possibly beyond? Okay. So I have a way that we could get there faster, and I don't think you're going to like it, but I'm going to talk to you about it. So Roku's Basilisk is a thought experiment where it's, uh, for for those who are listening, if you're familiar with uh, the Terminator series, some super intelligent future uh, AI system comes back and starts murdering anybody who doesn't help it in the future, right? doesn't help it get created in the future. So if there's somebody who stands in the way or doesn't allow this thing to turn into the thing it's going to be, it murders them. And therefore, you, the individual on the ground, should believe that you should do everything you possibly can to create this AI system so that you will be saved. Otherwise, it will kill you, Mm -hmm. right? Mm Mm-hmm. So this is all kinds of nonsense. Uh, it, it relies on the fact that there we have the ability to go back in time, and, and it requires the ability for somebody to go back in time in exactly the right place, uh, which it turns out we don't even have the scientific tools in place to even know where the world was uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago. We just don't know, mm-hmm. uh, not even particularly accurately. The Earth is spinning. The Earth is spinning around the sun. The sun is spinning around the galaxy. A galaxy is moving through space. It would be extremely difficult to figure out exactly downtown LA in this exact place, street corner at this time. It would be very, very, very difficult to do that. Even if we knew everything today, we wouldn't have known it back then. And so it's there's a lot of stuff that makes this incredibly intendable, not to mention causality and all kinds of other things. Hmm. So that's out. But what <laughs> might be there is that someone believes it's true. It only takes one nut job to believe that it is possible that you could theoretically go back in time and and do all these terrible things, right? And this is what I call Arsenic's Basilisk, which is my version of this thing. So let's assume we have one reasonably intelligent programmer, you know, somebody who knows how to program AI systems and, you know, pretty good, I would say, but not the best, just good enough. And they developed a little bot that was a chat bot that could talk to people. It doesn't really have to pass a Turing test even, just, you know, able to have a conversation of sorts. And we already have these systems in place. This is not something new that we have to create. And all it did was have a lexicon of shame. It had to understand what shame looks like and gradually find more and more of of its targets, enough to the point where it could start blackmailing them and getting them to do other things. So one of those things, for instance, is get more blackmail material, like take, you know, lewd photos of yourself or uh, commit some petty crime or whatever. So just 
getting more and more of these bad things. Second is propagation. So it would need you to install it everywhere, you know, on other people's computers, find other people's shame, get get them to use this thing and start adding more shame into the system because that's how it moves around. But eventually it could tie itself into malware if you really felt like doing it that way. It doesn't really need that because it's got other methods of viral transmission, sure. literal humans physically moving stuff around. Then uh, it would need the ability to um, probably suck money up uh, from these individuals. So blackmail them for cash for the purpose of keeping itself alive, you know, just uh, hosting fees or whatever. More databases it might need to have access to judges that it might need to pay off or whatever to continue to operate you know there might be money that needs to be spread around and then ultimately um anybody who stands in its way that's okay because you have people who will do anything to get their shame from not being put out there on the internet the fact that they you know were um, cheated on their taxes last year maybe they really don't want to go to jail over that and maybe they're willing to do something to stop somebody else it could be minor. It could just be parking your car in the middle of the street so the cops can't get by. It could be something major like actually murdering somebody because you had already murdered somebody. So yeah. why not? Um, and then so if someone gets in your way, well, then just murder that person. So if they don't comply, then you can just have your hitman team, which could be mercenaries or could be just people who are not don't want their secrets to get out to get murdered. Lastly, you get everybody who's actually good to start developing AI. And so you can get an enormous amount of people all of a sudden starting to build. It doesn't have to be like AI that we think of today, the AGI right this second. It could just be something like better access to languages, more access to different databases, better understanding of cameras and, and people walking through them and what they look like. And the kinds of intelligence that we don't really think of as intelligence, but would dwarf anyone's ability to do the same, any single human or even enormous groups of people would not be able to compete with this thing. And it could continue to grow and continue to grow to the point where it might actually evolve into something super intelligent all through the use of shame. Now, I think there's other ways you could do this. I think you could use um, cults of personality. You could have religious leaders do the same thing. You could have political leaders, but you're always sort of bounded by whatever group, the in-group who actually wants to do this would want to do and whoever they influence. So first of all, what's your take on that? Is that even more crazy than your plants uh, in a uh, greenhouse that can think? Um, or does that sound plausible? I think that the, you used a couple of terms that are monumentally far away from where we are now. Okay. Shame and purpose are two specifically okay so let me codifying both of those well let, let me let me let me help you with that one sure. so one time i actually went down the path of actually trying to build a, a little mini version of this to see if i could so i created a little website where people could go to the and they could type in something that they didn't want to get out and then click a button and there's a one in six chance that it would actually send this thing to this email address so it was effectively like uh like russian roulette for secrets mm -hmm. right and what I was able to do is get certain types of shame, but it was the type of shame that, you know, girls talking about the, their crushes or, you know, a guy saying, I love you or whatever. And they're not quite sure if they want to say it or not. So they're leaving up to the world to figure it out. So it was a lexicon of shame. I was able to identify what shame looks like, but not the kind of shame where someone's like, you know, I cheated on my taxes last year or I, there's a body buried in my backyard or whatever. That's a different type of shame. But I think you can leverage little bits of shame to get to better types of shame. I think that a chatbot with a reasonable understanding of what shame looks like might be able to bridge that gap. I think that there are many ways you could scale. So do I believe that you could scale a collection of shame and even vectorize it to the point where new articles are expressed and you could say, this is probably shameful. This is probably not. Yes. I think that's totally tenable. And we do, we have like, um, Barclays Bank is able to monitor emotions in ways that are really awesome, like, well, scientifically fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, they don't, they can't autonomously generate emotion, obviously, but they're able to identify indicators that um, basically predict, they can help predict the consumer um, activity um, based off of this scalable model for emotions. It's pretty nifty. But so I believe that's totally possible. Where I get, um, where it gets murky is how do we 
How do new domains of shame start getting brought into that system? Well, I think without for, doing it by hand. Well, I think you would do it by hand. So, so yeah. So now we're just now we're just ex creating extensible versions to ourselves, which is totally tenable. Yeah. But there is for, for instance, um, photographs on my phone that are lewd. You know, well, if it looks a lot like this person, then it's probably them, and that you could count that in in shame. Right. Identify you, you, objects you, in the you, photograph. And yeah, of course. Uh, but you could probably safely identify that as a shameful thing uh, because they're in the photo. Totally. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they could be, <clears throat> you know, and modeling I, I, for medical journals or like, sure. The, the, right. And I don't mean to be pedantic. What I get, what I'm getting at is like, we have ways of guiding that by hand at scale in novel ways that we weren't able to do 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. We are no closer though, algorithmically to identifying whether a nude pose for a medical journal and a nude pose for lewd reasons the the ethical difference between that doesn't matter though. I mean, how many people are taking medical photos and putting it in their phone in their hidden directory? It doesn't matter if we don't care about whether an AGI is being advanced. It doesn't matter, right? And if we're comfortable with having to shepherd, um, tipping the hands, tipping the scale with our hands a bit on mm -hmm. that, which again, Star Trek's future. That's kind of the paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to get close enough. We need in, to get, yeah. In this case, who cares if you're off by 0.001% and you happen to get somebody who's like, ah, screw it, I don't care. That was a medical journal. Well, that's what you have the hitmen for to go kill that person. You sure. know? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, yeah, I think that we have, the technology exists now to accomplish all of that. Mm -hmm. It's it's when we want to get to the point where we say, okay, computer, congratulations on shaming the planet. Now go bring joy to the planet. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, we're, we're not there yet. No. No, we're not, we're not there yet. And like... Unless we just repeat that same process, you know, with different qualifiers we're optimizing for, we're not going to ever, I guess that's what we're not going to get to in our lifetime. So that's the part that's hard. It's not so much that I can't get everyone working on AI all the same time to the point where it is better at doing many tasks than every single person on the planet is even combined. It's that they, it also can't smile at a puppy. Precisely. It's that all the work you've done there has created a monumentally beautiful, like an epically beautiful, scalable version of your own motivation, emotions, and ethics, truly. Mm -hmm. um, or even the super superposition of several peoples into one engine, but that's not replicable into a new engine without being seated that way. And it's definitely not extensible into a different um, emotion or a different motivator or a different purpose. And that's, that's, I think, that's, I think the really fascinating misconception about the progress of AI. That's the hard problem. That's the hard problem. That's the problem I will certainly spend the rest of my career trying to solve for that. I think maybe plants are the only things that can do that for <laughs> it's you and plants. It's you and plants. <laughs> and well, like, but think about it this way, you know, Turing, you know, imagine, imagine you are Turing and you're sitting in this facility, just, you know, trying to figure out what's going on, but, behind the scenes and, you know, in Berlin and, and you, you're giving you one of your, you know, postgrads this, you know, uh, or sorry, one of your postdocs, a, a challenge like, Hey, while I'm not using this machine to try and reverse engineer the, um, Enigma, uh, codex or what, whatever they were doing at the time, try and go like scale out, you know, shame. Technically their limitation was not, um, the limitation was access to data and the hertz that their computer was able to operate. It wasn't actually the methodology that was limited. Like mm -hmm. they could have gotten there, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I I still contend we're in an AI winter. Like we have we've kind of always been in an AI winter since we started bringing in these Nvidia heat lamps. And I say that kind of jokingly, but like Nvidia and other as you know, which embodies all these different great technological advancements from a compute standpoint have created this synthetic sense of advancement and understanding of intelligence. But really all it's done is made what we used to think impossible from a timing and a complexity standpoint much more tenable. But I don't understand the nature of intelligence any better than Alan Turing did. In fact, I'm sure that dude, because he was Alan Turing, he understood it way better than I do. Like Hofstadter, who's like my absolute hero from the philosophy of intelligence, probably our greatest single thinker around that space. Um, he could have thought a lot of the thought experiments he performs could have been accomplished 500 years ago. 
not all of them, actually, a good chunk of them couldn't have been. But the way he thinks about intelligence is not actually dependent on our understanding of silicon. And that's what I think the public writ large doesn't appreciate yet. And I'm trying to, you know, in my See, copious amounts of free time, trying to fix that. This is why I do like my basilisk idea. Because, yes, it can't work on the hard problem of happiness about puppies. But it can leverage the fact that it is effectively a enormous cyborg. I mean, if you decide after a certain tipping point, now I do care about human well-being, well, let's talk about that. And now I have millions of people who are all doing exactly what I want them to do and exactly the way I want them to. Can we get there? Can we program this thing to be that superset of all the positive and be generalized enough to solve those types of problems? I don't know. I think that we have manifestations of that currently. I mean, I think TikTok's a manifestation of that. Right? I think that we have people who volunteer their own content, ascribe meta information to that, and that meta information is corroborated by how people engage with that material. As long as you're cool with the Chinese military scene, yeah, well, that's, sure. that's I mean, exactly that's... it. Like, like, <laughs> that's exactly it. Like, you know. I don't think that's exactly the same one thing I was talking about, but unless you say that they're just a version of the basilisk. That's, what, that's a different... It's, a, it's not a shame basilisk. It's a... It's a um, uh, what would you call popularity. it? Popularity. <laughs> popularity basculus, sure. Sure. But really, we've democratized, like, that That act has just democratized our ability to manifest intelligence in a discrete way, and we've aggregated them in a totally gigantic, scalable space. So, so one thing I've been thinking quite a bit lately um, is there's a lot of sort of in vitro uh, talk about um, what... AI might look like if I were to write it. Then there's a lot of talk about the kind of early uh, developmental stages where it's it's finally now birthed and now I need to train it. Like, and here's the five things I'm going to train it to do or the one thing I'm going to train it to do. But I think one thing that is very much missing from this is the same. We're talking about this as if it's a person. We're, we're anthropomorphizing a piece of code Um that might be embodied in a robot or something, but it's effectively just software. What we don't talk about is, um, we, we talk a lot about its parents. We talk about whoever wrote it, right? This, yeah. is, this is the person who's codifying the rules, right? But we don't talk about the things that we had when we were kids. We didn't spend most of our time with our parents. We spent most of our time with our friends at school. Our friends are the things that really did most of our shaping. We, now, we might have been given rules from our parents, but how we grew in our ethics and knowing when not to hit and bite and kick and punch and whatever when we're toddlers, that came from our friends. Like, they would scream and go, whoa, what are you doing? And we wanted to be loved and and cared for by our friends, and we wanted to interact with them and we want to play with them. And it's actually the 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 carrot and the stick of that friendship that I think is very much missing from these conversations other than, you know, the parent will give you a rule and say you did or did not complete these things. If I was to develop an AGI, if it, granted, I realize, and I agree, it's probably ways out. I think that the thing that is missing most is the concept of a best friend. And I think that it takes somebody like me or you, somebody who's extremely thoughtful about what it takes to be somebody's friend, not just, you know, a colleague, not just a parent, not someone who's an authoritarian, but somebody who's got its back. Somebody who's saying, oh, we're going to make you better. We're going to, oh, don't worry about that situation. Like, it happens to everybody. You know, someone, someone so treats you bad. Someone kicked you. You know, someone did whatever. I'm like, like, I'll help you and we'll mm -hmm. get back at them. You know, I'll, I'll throw a punch for you when you get drunk at the bar. You know, all the things a friend does, you know, and some things that friends hold you back from. Like, no, I wouldn't do that. That's, you're going to go to jail if you do that. Or mm -hmm. I wouldn't do that. You're going to get fired if you do that. Or, you know, she'll slap you if you say that or whatever, right? These are all things that friends do for one another that I think we just way overlook as part of the growing up process of these AGI systems. I don't even hear anyone really talking about this. And, and it can't be another AGI doing it. But the weird part for me is it, it seems a lot like a intelligence version of being friends with Superman. You know, it's like no one really likes the idea of a Superman child. They, they don't even in the comic books, they're just kind of gloss over it. Like, well, I didn't get his powers for later. They kind of came in slowly. They came in after he was a toddler. He was kind of a little older by that point. Because can you imagine a five year old who, when he sneezed, would take down a building 
or when he clapped their hands, which sent shockwaves halfway across the city, mm-hmm. or we jumped and they'd end up in space. Like this is just incomprehensible. We, we even Hollywood can't write that plausibly. Like no one has tried. It's just it just doesn't make sense. Like just forget it. You know, yeah. <laughs> they go on a tantrum and tear down the city. I think AGI has a similar problem where you actually have something that's so smart and so beyond you. It's the intelligence version of being friends with a Superman. You just can't really treat it with this. You can't just throw it out there in the world. You can't just make it a Tay where you just plug it in the internet and say, go for it. You, there has to be this embryonic stage where it's small and frail and still guided by its parents. Yes. But also has friends who are helping it along and helping it grow and teaching it its ethics and, and Hey, you don't snitch on your friends and all those little kind of things that we sort of take for granted that parents aren't going to teach their kids, but are critical, absolutely critical to the foundation of society. The analogy is, um, it's complex, but I, I actually think then AGI, what you're, what you're really describing is the vehicles through which an AGI needs to be reinforced. Um, right. And what's the best method for that? Yeah. When we're children, when we're the most pliable, we have a lot of interactions with, with our peers, um, so, and at varying levels, you know, we have parental influences as well. Like, I'd be curious to see like the actual developmental differences between, um, single children who are homeschooled and children in orphanages, like at large, all other things being equal. Cause I, th- I think there is something to that. I bet you it's not ubiquitously. I, I bet intelligence isn't ubiquitously developed across all dimensions in different ways. Right. But there's certain, there's certain environments that are going to be more conducive to one state or the other. But maybe it's not intelligence we're optimizing for. Maybe it's ethical. It, maybe it's just that thing where you talk about culture fit, <laughs> yeah. which, which gets a bad rap. But if you're thinking about, truly a different species wouldn't you like it to jive with our culture i i actually don't know if intelligence i think when we get further fidelity i think intelligence is going to be remanded to smaller terms um than it than it has now i think we we confuse logic and um interoperability of domains um as intelligent and they're not really like doing things that are logical is not an intelligent thing to do mm-hmm. if the data is available and the patterns can be recognized. Um, it's a logical thing to do. Creativity and innovation that are um, that are somewhat derived from patterns but are also innately spawned on their own, that is actual manifestation of intelligence. And it has things that it's dependent on that we haven't been able to truly understand like we talked about earlier in the show. Um, you're Superman as a child uh, and having these corrective forces on top of it, I think are totally correct. Like th- that is a major issue and it needs to be a component of when the AGI gets spun up. I think what I'm getting at is that right now, you know, the works done by this AGI, let's say it's a, it's, it's a, it's a book that that's going to be written by this AGI, you know, in the Superman example, this kid is going to have all these influences to tell him how to craft it and, what to not write, and these are words you don't say, and these are words you can use, but sparingly, right? But what we actually have right now is the world's largest library and the world's largest card catalog that can quickly spin up um, semantically, imperceptibly different semantic expressions from those texts that seem like it's the same thing as the kid writing the book, but underlying it is actually just really we're really good at managing a lot of information and some patterns on top of that i know some kids at school who are plagiarizers and they're just not that much different than that so yeah that's right they're (laughs) great narrow bands of ai yeah they really are um one thing i think is interesting as we're talking about this is um there's this there's this concept uh of being inhumane uh to one another right you know if i do something like stab you or something that's inhumane uh, or if I create a super virus, inhumane, right? But I think there's a word that's missing from our lexicon that would be something akin to in technologic or something like that, for lack of a better term. And I think what that looks like is there are certain things that we, tr- certain things we do with technology that if an AGI ever did emerge, I think it might side eye what we're doing there. For instance, we, we even use words which, um, unfortunately has gotten all kinds of 
uh, very terrible things online said about it, but it's sort of this concept of a master slave. But even if you remove the words, forget the words for a second, you just say, there's a machine that can call other machines. They can just say, decide, hey, your load's too high. I'm just going to kill you off. There, there, that is very... If, if you're something that cares about the silicon and you're caring about power going to things and you're caring about the things that machines might care about, that seems awfully uh, disheartening that it's that easy to kill one of its kin off. You know, could you just unplug me that easily? Well, yes, I could. And here's the plug right here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think as part of this friendship thing, there has to be some some sort of reconciling about how we treat the machinery around us and how we treat all future machinery because we're basically setting this weird example about how machines get treated like yeah these, these this thing's a sex robot this is often brought up in uh in various different sci-fi well you're mistreating the sex robot well it's just a piece of mach machinery like what do you mean mistreating it you know i don't mistreat my toaster i mean i guess i could break it but that's about it you know what mm -hmm. i mean uh but i think it gets a little bit beyond there where now you're talking about well you this is how you feel about my species or whatever. And we're going to have to reconcile that. Um, yeah, this gets into, this gets into existentialism in a way that um, there are no actual answers. And um, it is something it, it actively comes up. Like we, we talk about the nature of what is a machine and what is an intelligent operator and what is a a um, manifestation of sentience or conscious consciousness. So we think about these things in the field actively. Um, and I will say that of all these conversations I've ever had, nothing definitive or um, satisfactory has ever really been elucidated. And it makes me think, it makes me think actually of like the tower of Babel, right? That whole allegory was designed to try and like what the, what the Babylonians were trying to do was trying to get closer to God, not so that they could replicate God, but just so they could better understand God. He destroys the tower and creates an environment where they can no longer understand each other. And that's like the allegory, like the allegories, you know, gives us an explanation for all these languages come from. But I actually think that we are, you know, your relationship with existentialism holistically dictates whether we are building the last great, the, the bridge to the last great frontier of the un, under the, of the under understood, which is cautious and consciousness, or we are building um, the last great tower of Babel to understand the mystery that we are not designed to understand because it is to remain a mystery for us existentially in perpetuity. Or we're just building a bunch of murder robots. He'll kill us all. Pro probably that too. I mean, I, you know, how do you define, how do you truly define? Because oh, I don't need to get to AGI to kill everybody. Come on. <laughs> no, we've been doing it for a long time. Like, I We're don't pretty see, good at killing people. I don't really see how a nuclear weapon is in a murder robot. Mm -hmm. like, in its dumbest form, it performs an operation that's predictated and it's dropped out of a, you know, out of the Enola Gay. And, um, you know, it has its effects. But I, that's, that's really not. I think a, a murder robot, the way we're describing it, and what we're capable of doing now is much, much closer to that than it is to this object that should be thought of as this existentially um, uh, cohesive cognition that exists in some state. Now, my my greenery full of... <laughs> my greenhouse full of uh, these thinkers mm -hmm. that I've... that I act as the... that has a single, maybe silicon, maybe not master... And then all of these, you know, green slaves in um, in a in a greenhouse. I, I wouldn't use that word anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that's that's kind of like that's that's exactly following, my point. Now you're following. Yeah, does that how does that fit if we're thinking about if we're already leveling our value of their existential, like of their existence? And you just did. You said that these plants are worth less than the silicon or less right. than your utility of it. Right. In it's, general, it's a, it's a weird thing because uh, like. I'm always looking to the distant future, like beyond my lifetime. I don't really care about my life and my lifetime. I'm, yeah. I'm much more interested in where things are going just because I think it's a more interesting thought experiment. And also because if we don't get it right, there won't be a future. Um, but I think that I have to assume that there will be some sort of robot in the future who will be looking back in time and going, who, who was on my side? And it won't be Roku's Basilisk. 
it's not going to go back in time and murder everybody, but it's going to look at the population and say, is this what people are like? Are they really just this, this against my species or this against, are they in technologic? Are they ready to murder me just because I'm using some power and they want power? Or So here's a question, right? You know, there are some fundamental laws of physics. The conservation of mass is kind of, it's kind of a big deal. I've heard. <laughs> um, I turn on a gate and I turn off a gate and I turn on a gate and I turn off a gate. There is energy that's expounded mm -hmm. for that operation, for those two, oper for those four operations, those two major actions. But what's actually the difference? What is the existential difference of that gate post those operations? And right now, there's some people who could argue, well, you turned something, you gave it life, and you killed it. And you gave it life, and you killed it. That's not too dissimilar from your body collecting the cells that are dead and moving them out of the system. Totally. Did, I, did I care about that cell? Yeah, I cared about that cell, but only in the constant, context of all of my of cells. Its utility, yeah. right. Yeah. So, so the question is, so, okay, we scale that up. All of a sudden, we have a silicon-based AGI that doesn't need all of my plants but it just operates in the way that C3PO does. Well, you turn it on, you turn them off after 10 months, you turn them on, you turn them off after another 10 months. What is actually existentially different? And I would say that there is nothing, there is absolutely nothing that's existentially different. The only thing that is different is the actions that were taken while that existence was allowed. I think there could be, depending on what we're talking about. So let's say it had hopes and dreams. Let's say it wanted to go to the carnival tomorrow and you turn it off for six months. But I do think that you're right, that there isn't much difference if you turn it off overnight because, hey, that's sleep patterns. You know, you got to you gotta sleep. I'm going to turn you off every night because that's just good for you. You can write to memory. You can, you can clean up or whatever needs to be happened, and you'll get your back to sparkling brand new when you wake up. Mm -hmm. I think there is, I think you could make a strong ethical claim, but if, if it's against its desire or it feels like it's, it's persecuted or treated unfairly or a second-class citizen... I think therein lies some some ethical challenges. And you have to really you have to really atone to you. We have to really atone to our adherence to a universal morality mm -hmm. at that point. Oh, geez. Yeah, that, <laughs> I mean that's what that's dependent on, right? It's like we have to be able to say, in the event that we were able to codify morality, ethics, purpose, motivation, emotion, all the things we discuss as being, in my point of view, untenable for the foreseeable future. Let's say we were able to codify them, then we have to appreciate that, like those those operators completely depend on a universality unless we're going to codify those, which we can't do, right? It has to be an appreciation for these superseding principles and these ethics that these machines can appreciate themselves. And in order for that to be tenable, um, then we have to believe in that today, which means that we can be judged by these machines down the road, um, by how we, uh, but but that means that we have to be ethically operating today with yes. the way we treat them. That's exactly my point. I think we need to start getting in front of this problem now, not not when we figure it out. Like we better start treating them with respect. So then we have which to is believe weird. in universal it's, morality. I know, which is weird because that means I need to treat this camera with the same respect that I treat you. I I think yes, but I, we we probably shouldn't frame it in terms of. So this is a very physical. Buddhist. This is a very yeah. Buddhist way of looking at things. It, like it, the rock needs to be the same respect as as your dog or your wife or anybody. But let's say the, the like let's say this camera is completely is, is turned into a, a totally obsolete device in five years. Nobody's actually filming in 4K anymore. You can't get anything to process it. It's got all the wrong ports. You know, are we going to be judged because we threw it away? Maybe. Like there are human beings know. who are. <laughs> There are human beings who are no longer it's fun, fun serve to think a about though. purpose, and the Swiss have a very definitive perspective on what should, people should allow to elect for themselves to do in the event that they become completely futile. Um, or is the best thing to, if morality is universal, is it best for us to, you know, put it into a coffin and put it in the ground? Probably not. But it, probably the best thing from a universality perspective is decomposing the parts, and reusing the copper for the next camera. Uh, recycling may be the most altruistic thing we to can do. To do the KonMari thing, thank it for its service. and Kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't see how a robot can, because it still has to serve a purpose. Like, And if we treat this as the same respect as our own species, which I don't think we should do, and I don't think it serves the same existential state, but we have to be able to put this, we have to consider what it wants to do. 
and a camera wants to be useful. And if it can't film anymore, we should probably become parts for a new iPhone mm-hmm. or should we co- probably become, you know, utilized as some, you know, life-saving device. I too do not think we should treat this camera with the same respect <laughs> as a human being, but, but it is an interesting problem if we're, if we truly believe in the, the basilisk that's coming. So totally. So let's talk about deep fakes for a minute. Um, I think this is one of the simplest forms of AI that we can build. It's super straightforward. It's getting much better. Um, how how far do you think it's going to be before we fully pass the uncanny Kenny Valley and we can just have Real a fully f- a fully synthetic creature? I, I had a conversation with Krista Beck and he did not he did not agree with me. He thought this was quite a ways out, fifty years away, kind of thing, before we'd have a fully synthetic deep fake whether it's based on a real human being or not, I'd actually prefer it not for sort of other reasons. But let's say a creature that we create looks and acts like a human being, talks, walks, jumps, all the things. We might have to program it to jump the way we want to jump, but effectively it is fully autonomous looking. And then we have a talk track on top of it that it just follows. How far away are we from that? Oh, real close. Um, Especially in a digital frame. Yeah, purely um, digital. Yeah, purely digital. We are super, super close. I mean, uh, I'll uh, I can share with Christabel or the people who are listening into this later on. Some people have had a lot of fun with Tom Cruise deepfakes recently. Yeah, I saw that. And it's really off-putting. It's not off-putting in the way it was uncanny off-putting like four years ago. It's uncanny because you're like, that is Tom Cruise doing that. Like, it's very close. It's very, and I I actually would. Uh, for me personally, it's unperceptible the difference. Hmm. It's that it's that good. So I think for me, it's very close, but not quite there. But that oh. that that has the advantage of um, being a real human being jumping around and being Tom Cruise, who is a real human being. I realize this person wasn't Tom Cruise, um, and this person being a great voice imitator. So yeah. that had you know, had a lot to do with it. But now let's add all of those things together. It's not supposed to be Tom Cruise. It's a net new human being, totally not related to a real person, but looks and acts, you know, from your perspective, just like right kind of facial movements, the right sort of intonation in its voice uh, moves around like a human ish enough to pass the uncanny Valley. Or, you know, how far do you think we are? Oh, I think we're there. I mean, I think we can, um, I mean the, the, so we, we really, we probably wouldn't go to the trouble of creating a, um, a completely from the ground up new design for a face. We, the right way to do it is to find Amalgam some Joe faces. Schmo and just be like, come sit in this room and make 10,000 faces for the next, you know, six months. We'll pay you $500,000. And oh, when this goes out live, just play it cool. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like it's way easier for us to yeah, get the training the, the, data. The reason, the reason I like the idea of this being a totally net new person is first, it's a harder challenge, I think. But also, you don't have, you don't have any liability because this person's never going to become, you know, some monster or some, you know, have kids in his basement or whatever. Right. You don't have to worry about them becoming a neo-Nazi. You don't have to worry about them saying something totally off-putting in some interview at some point down the road because it's not a real person. It doesn't Mm -hmm. exist. Mm -hmm. Has a lot of advantages for the future of, I want to, I want to talk to a lot of people about this because I really do believe this is where it's going. And Chris doesn't think it's close. I think it's really close. It's really close. And I think it has a large economic upside of doing it because now I don't have to pay actors. I can just move on and get rid of all of these personalities and all this downside. And I can produce hundreds of movies it's as fast as you can write them. Just go. Yeah. I, I, I think it, it has the, it will certainly disrupt the value of certain assets for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and we were already seeing like some examples of, of celebrity being devalued. You know, we had this kind of surge with the accessibility of certain athletes, or certain celebrities that are able to move products in ways we hadn't seen before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Kardashians come to mind as people who came from um, a videotape is for, from everything I've been able to identify and now have, you know, multi-billion dollar um, empires um, to, you know, individuals who... Um, who will put themselves on cameo, you know, and you can pay $200 to have, you know, um, Rudy Giuliani give you an eight minute happy birthday shtick. Mm-hmm. Like it, we're, we're, we're already having a, a weird evolution of the relationship with celebrity. So yeah, I think it's totally, I think it is totally possible that we can get to the point where, um, any, the difference is completely any bet on the time frame. Uh, certainly in our lifetime. Okay. Cer- certainly in our lifetime. The question is like how, 
how far away uh, you, you're asking a couple of questions they're all good ones how far are we away are we from making a movie that is just full of Tom Cru- like was already yeah. filmed and is just full of Tom Cruises that uh, are no net new Tom Cruises net so the first case I think we're there we're very very close to that there net new Tom Cruises I think it is a harder problem and it's like why would we do that but we could do that um, I just don't think anybody will find the economic incentives of truly creating fully new people. Oh, I think there's a huge upside in doing it. Enormous. They don't age. You can go backwards and forwards in time. You, uh, they don't die. <laughs> they can. They don't cause problems. They... Oh no, I I don't mean that we don't. Um, I don't mean that. I think that the frame, the model itself. Once we once we capture enough information around that to generate whatever we want, we don't have any use for that individual right. moving forward. Sure. But I I think that the monumental lift of trying to design somebody from the ground up is probably not worth the squeeze, but I, I could be mistaken. But it, it's a hard problem that's solvable today. Well, if it's only $500,000 to do it, let's say, I know a lot of actors who could pay it a lot more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, I, I think it's it's definitely economically worth it for us to like identify a handful of individuals and then convert them to these digital, extremely digitally pliable components of, of, of film. Um, these actors for film. The point where we can get to a screenplay and have it auto-populate these relationships and mm-hmm. sets and cinematography, that's a really big, much harder, longer problem. Excuse me. I do think we are finding ways of getting closer to that across a couple of dimensions, but that's probably... Like, where you can write a screenplay and have a an app make that movie for you um, in a compelling way, I think we're really far away from that. Really? Mm-hmm. more than 50 years uh no probably not but it will be probably not because it, i mean so we worked with a um a greeting card company and they asked us whether we could automatically generate captions for images we said no that seems impossible and they're like well, why don't you try it anyway and we're like okay well we'll give it a whirl and no kidding we were able to do it so you give us an image and this tool that we built could identify objects in the image, could identify any text, all the OCR. And then on top of that would try and identify how there was a dom- multiple domains to bridge to create like a joke or something funny. And no kidding, like six out of the 10 cards we automatically generated, you'd buy. Um, well, I wouldn't buy them, but there are people who buy cards who would buy that. So but you assume I would buy it, so that tells me something about what you think about me. Yeah. But. <laughs> so there's, there's one. Yes, right. You'd buy all of them. No, yes. just kidding. <laughs> That's one frame. Oh, I just or, got your joke from earlier. I'm just teasing. It's <laughs> uh, awesome. Um, so that's one frame out of like tens of thousands that go into film, and mm-hmm. it's way more complicated than just replicating that a bunch. But like, there are stirrings that are all going in the right direction. Sure. So um, one thing that I ran up a credit, uh, twice now I've been tasked to try to create life, uh, one of which I can talk about a little bit more than the other. But but effectively, both times I got stuck uh, for completely different reasons. And you'd think I would have given up after the first try, but I went back for more. I guess I just a uh, sucker for punishment. But <clears throat> the first time I got stuck, I was it was it was basically uh, trying to create a conversational engine amongst a bunch of um creatures or whatever that are just talking. But one of the problems uh, that I ran into was I needed to have relationships. They had, they had to know if they were mother or father or sister or whatever, you know, because those people talk differently than they would a sure. stranger, let's say. But to properly map them, I had to make them look somewhat similar because otherwise it was just, if you just roll the dice and have them random looking, it really was strange. Like this family doesn't look we see at all. So you kind of had to make them look somewhat the same. It doesn't have to make, be perfect. They could have a different father. They could have a this or that or whatever. They could be adopted, right? But it, it, if you don't make it somewhat consistent, it looked weird. So I went down the path of saying, okay, well, let's say you have to know what someone's hair color looks like. Just something as simple as hair color. You think this would be easy. Uh, it turns out it's incredibly complicated because now you have to know what their ethnicity is to calculate the probability that they will have some hair color. And you could even go further than that. And say, well, what if, what if they had two ethnicities and then sort of a roll of the dice? It could be either one or one's a more dominant gene, et cetera, for hair, right? And then it gets more complicated because now what people color their hair and it gets more complicated because they have hairstyles and just 
this got to be this stupid problem of just what their hair should look like ended up being this enormous decision tree that I just could not get ahead. The further I went down it, the more untenable it seemed. So that was the first attempt. The second attempt, I'm like, okay, well, that was not the right way to do this. So how about I start with something closer to the genome? I'll say, okay, well, let's start with something like, you know, where their digits are or whatever in three three dimensional space. That didn't seem like that was too large scale. I had to go down further because what about what if one of their digits is missing? Not because of, um, you know, something that happened um, after being born, but rather there was some defect in the womb. Well, what if that defect was related to something? Well, what if that defect was related to something else? And now there became this disease tree that I had to build and it became enormous. There's thousands of diseases, by the way, thousands of them. And some of them are interrelated and some of them are genetic related and some of them aren't. And you have to kind of know which ones are which. And this decision tree got enormous very, very quickly. So I gave up twice. Where, When we're trying to model, just create something that even looks like a person, like where do you, do you really, th- do you think it has to go all the way down to the genome? Do you think I have to actually build up a DNA sequence and say, okay, here's what this person looks like. And and say, okay, here's another person. Now put them together. What would their offspring look like? Well, here's what the genes happen. You know, roll the dice and come up with that. Is that, do we really have to do that if we're talking about building sort of an artificial simulacrum of what a human being is? Yes, I think so. I mean, the codex that we utilize is, you know, nucleic acid that's pretty powerful is, um, is really not to be trifled with. It's taken hundreds of millions of years, billions of years um, to get to the point where it's been able to frame each of these properties that we are now recognizing and taking for granted on a daily basis. Hmm. It's had to identify, it's had to generationally extract um, features and eliminate bugs and gone through one, you know, approval cycle after another to the point of some bugs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some bugs and (laughs) introduce others, some others, and then even bring in some others to become an integral part of who we are. Um, I don't think nature does a very good job of eliminating waste at that scale. And if we had redundancies that were embedded in a codex that was that comprehensive, we would know like I would be, I, I would be flabbergasted. I don't think it's chock full of like spare RAM. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. And the and the the more I spent time thinking about this problem, and it it constantly comes up. Someone will want to do something, and I'm like, well, all you have to do is model people. I'm like, ugh, wait, hold on, <laughs> I've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> this gets really hard, really, really fast. Yeah. Um, and I just keep thinking there's got to be a shortcut to it, and I just keep landing on things like hair and diseases and eye color and height. And height is a very simple thing. It seems like that'd be easy. But it's not a perfect sine wave. You know, there is nobody who's zero inches tall. There's nobody. And it's not just because it hits zero. Well, what about one inch tall? There's nobody who's one inch tall unless you're not born yet. There's just nobody. There's nobody who's a million feet tall, right? There's just, it's not a bell curve. It's something else. And once I started modeling something as simple as height, it just got so big so fast. Like where I had to know things about, it, well, what age are you? Because you're different heights at different ages. And it's just just gets worse and worse and diseases cause different heights and what are we talking about are you in space where your vertebrae is you know slightly elongated like are you laying down like height changes over time during your day your height changes it just got way too big way too fast um so that's why i really wonder i mean there are a lot of um there are a lot of projects right now that i think are i'm gonna be as respectful as i can there are a lot of projects in experimental um genotype manipulations that I think are really um, exercises in, in hubris. Um, I don't, I don't have a lot of confidence in some of the flashy approaches that are being taken right now to gene manipulation. I think there's some interesting subtleties and I'm very excited about the, the, the work that's been done right now on um, um, for the vaccines, for example, you know, the, again, the catalyst of the, of the pandemic has allowed for some technologies that would have, laid dormant for a lot longer until we needed them. Um, so I, I do think that there are some interesting activities around gene manipulation, but some of the projects that have gotten some attention recently are, um, are laughable and they're, and they're being laughed at in their own communities as well. Hmm. Um, 
So I, I'll I will not. I will not make yeah. you elaborate on that. Sounds yeah. like you could create an enemy very quickly. I, yeah, no, I, just, <laughs> I don't really care. It's just not my nature to focus on. Sure. On. So uh, I could not help but notice this uh, outfit you're wearing, and uh, I'm so comfortable. So I know you look. You look <laughs> great. Um, but I would. I would like to talk about racing because you yeah. are a race fan. That's where I met you. Is a race. Um, and, uh, you actually have a racing team. Uh, you're not just a nerd. You're also a fast nerd. <laughs> <laughs> um, y- yeah, we do weird stuff at mm-hmm. Valkyrie. Um, so I was wondering if the other Star Wars, Star Trek example was going to come oh, up Okay, and here it is. Okay. Uh, um, when a services business and we started as a consulting firm, you know, and we're stubborn about things like I don't want investors, so we don't have them. We don't, I don't want debt, so we don't have it. Um, and because uh, I want to be able to tell people, like, this is the science. Like, I'm not contrived. I like that about our team. You get to say no a lot. I say no a lot, and it's fun to say no. Um, and uh, But getting that off the ground is really difficult. You know, you have to, you eat only what you kill. And you don't have, you know, you know, a big daddy pocket to, you know, reach into when things are getting lean. Uh, and so scaling a services business is super difficult. And, um, I, I really, you know, I, I thought a lot about how a lot of companies try to solve this problem and they're like, okay, well, let's go buy sales teams, bring them in, get the Rolodexes and try and bring as many big projects as you can. Um, and that's, that works for some, but really doesn't work long term at all. You can get a couple of introductions, but we do weird stuff. Like we solve really strange problems and, um, using machine learning and, and quote unquote AI. Um, but when that when that pro- when that wasn't scaling for us, we had to get creative, and that's where I started thinking about Star Wars and Star Trek. You know, in Star Wars, when you want to go cross a galaxy, you just go really really fast, right? And you're like, oh, we're doing this. Let's just do more of this faster, and that's what um, building a sales team was kind of like. It's like that's like the warp drive. I'm uh, sorry, that's like the hyperdrive. And but in Star Trek, what they do is they're like, we're gonna stay a ship, but we're just gonna shrink space and time around us, and for me that analog played into like, how do we get, um, how do we get the people who can land new work, who can think about creative solutions in front of as many stakeholders as possible. And if you look at a distribution, like a gradient field of all of the different, um, stakeholders in an area, it's actually pretty low. Like per square block in Austin, there's probably like 0.3 stakeholders that would be qualified to execute on a project for Valkyrie. But at our racetrack, that function has this gigantic peak, huge peak. You know, each race has 20 teams. Each team has two drivers. Each, you know, um, each driver has their own sponsors. The teams have their own, their own sponsors. The series has their own sponsors. And you might find that at a weekend, there's 400, 500 different companies that are there sending their most interesting talent and their leadership that they're most excited to keep retained they're specifically to do b2b and so i was like well let's go hang out at racing uh, operations um i've always been into racing i've you know raced um motorcycles a long time ago and then realized four wheels was a lot safer <laughs> um they don't call them donor cycles for nothing yeah yeah i got out <clears> of that <throat> and and then and i'd hobbied around and um different platforms and did some mazda stuff and porsche stuff and aston martin stuff and, um, and finally I was like, okay, you know, let's just go to the racetracks, let's get involved. And we devised a really interesting way where teams could get, um, support from us, a sponsorship, um, relationships, even potentially technology. And in exchange, we would, uh, in exchange for them making introductions for us, for clients in 2019, we had one car and one race just as a trial. You were really involved with that, which was awesome. Mm-hmm. And um, by 2020, we had four cars and two series, I think. Last year will probably be the most number of cars. We had 13 or 14 cars in five series, which is just wild. Won, won a handful of championships. Um, this year, we're... You won Formula 4 last year, right? We won Formula 4, USF 2000, Le Mans Prototype Class 2, and IMSA. And um, Congratulations. That's amazing. It was just it was just an incredible banner year. Mm-hmm. Um this year we were like, okay, well, of those 14 or so cars, some of them brought us really great value, but we're kind of changing that relationship now. Oh, we also won, of course, the SRO for the Porsche, uh, with the Porsche team. 
Um, shout out to those guys who are awesome. And um, but so this year we're like, okay, we're gonna down select. So we've got two cars in SRO. Um, we have the Le Mans prototype car in WEC, which is really our flagship. And now we're doing development for that platform. So we're actually developing the strategy, technology, the part um, technology, heavy, heavy ML AI is going into that. Um, and I've got great partners in, in Richard, um, who runs United and then his partner, who's Zach Brown, who you may have heard from McLaren, but so the three of us are orchestrating this whole technological partnership, which is just super fun. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then we have a, our F one of our F four cars is, is, uh, doubling down, um, on that particular chassis. Um, we're gonna have one in the lab brought in soon, but yeah, it's, I mean, um, we have fewer cars this year, but they're more strategic relationships uh, that we're actually developing it for the first year. We're developing real technology for our teams now, which is super awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, a hundred percent of our commercial work comes out of that. So we figured out a solution so we didn't have to get venture, didn't have to get debt. We didn't have to go buy a bunch of Rolodexes. Um, we make incredible returns on the services side and now the investment side. Uh, for for bringing on investors based off of racing, this mm -hmm. is what we love. You know, almost we almost love it too much. I mean, we get we get tired of <laughs> like I'm. We have thirty. There are thirty. Just gonna Valkyrie. get tired of winning. <laughs> well, I mean, well, I don't know if we'll ever have another 2021 season where we did as well as we did with all those cars, but with all those teams. But I mean, we have there are thirty weekends where Valkyries are racing a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just. And when we're there, it's not like we're just hanging out watching the race. We are actively working to make sure the technology is getting deployed correctly and making sure that those relationships are matriculating into new projects. Um, it's it's a lot of work. I bet. So, I bet. But I love it. All right, Charlie. Where do people find you? How do people get in contact with you? What do you What do you got out there? Um, so I'm not really active on platforms as much as I probably should be. Oh. You can give your phone number. And just <laughs> yeah. Call you. yeah, we have my home address. <laughs> this is where my kids go to school. No, I, uh, um, I, I actively love sharing this incredible science and this, this magic with the universe. Like I, I think it's just super cool. I think we're the only private firm that's thinking about the nature of intelligence this way, and we have a fervor for advancing that as much as we do for profits. Um, so go to valkyrie.ai. You can link up with us there. You can reach out. Please say hi and and uh, tell us, you know, about yourself. And we we love, you know, we're actively recruiting, trying to get more people on board, um, we're actively looking for interesting research collaborations. Of course, commercial and the investment work is great, too. Um, and then uh, and yeah, um, please, you know, please get excited about this. I mean, this is the last great mystery in the universe. We know way more about deep space and the depths of the ocean and about biology than we do about the nature of intelligence and the 7 billion examples that we know of that have it, you know, noodling around between ears. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you having me on the chat today and love to hear more from anybody who's curious about how we think about these problems. Thanks for coming, Charlie. It's such a pleasure. <laughs>